Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Hi, YouTube Live. Welcome back. Uh, we are here in uh, Kyoto and also online having a hybrid workshop. Uh, we're doing our second session now. So this is the workshop Creativity Unleashed. And um, for today's session, it's going to be a roundtable discussion on what creative technologies are uh, and how, I mean, not really what they are, but what how they're fitting into our creative processes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and share some slides to give an introduction and to welcome everybody who's joining us for the first time and didn't, uh, didn't catch the first session. So let me go ahead and share these now. All right. Awesome. All right, great. So like I said, we are on our second session today. Uh, we had a first session uh, yesterday, Japan time, which may still be the same day for some of you, I think, depending on the time zone, but you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna, not gonna work that out. Uh, so we are here um, uh, and we also have two more, uh, sorry, three more sessions uh, for the rest of the week. Um, we're not gonna go any longer than three hours per session, um, including today. So what's gonna happen is we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, discuss, take a small break and then continue. Um, and we'll go all the way up until three hours, but, but no longer than that. So uh, um, of course, like I said, we're uh, streaming on YouTube Live, which is where you're seeing us right now, but you might also be watching this as a recording as well. So we're recording all of our sessions, um, particularly the talks and anything that we uh, all vote on that can go as a recording. Um, so if you didn't see the session yesterday, you can uh, wait. I think it's it's not going to be on YouTube right now, but maybe by the time you see this recording, it, it, it is up. So uh, we'll post them very shortly after we have the sessions. All right. So without further ado, um, the topic of today's session is, of course, the roundtable discussion on the future uh, hybrid interfaces of human and uh, machine technologies doing creative things together. How are we uh, how are we building hybrid systems to uh, create new things? And how is that hybrid interface changing the way that we are able to have uh, creative processes and what we're able to build and create? So just real, real quick, uh, there's going to be uh, we have this um, uh, uh, description for today's session. So within the last year or two, of course, creative technologies that leverage AI have become way more popular than, sorry, popular than ever. So they're now, or will soon, if they haven't already for you, um, play a prominent role in the creative process for many individuals with a wide range of backgrounds. So not just um, artists who do uh, two-dimensional uh, digital illustrations, but also people who might be doing um, uh, mathematical proofs science and other creative endeavors as well. So in this session, uh, everybody is gonna talk about their creative workflow and their processes in their diverse mediums and their fields. So how is AI technology being used for you? Uh, how could it be used for you? How would you like it to be, uh, to be used? Um, what is missing from the process? Um, and also how shouldn't it be used as well? What would be really bad? What do you not wanna see? So we're thinking about uh, uh, we're imagining all these different ways that we could build technology to, I don't know, accomplish all of our different goals. So after the break, we're going to regroup and sort of think about how this technology could be designed to enable or support our workflows. We're going to be taking notes throughout the entire session. And what we want to do ultimately is we want to come up with either a uh, list of suggestions of what can uh, what could we could build, what we should focus on as people who are building these technologies. So we want to create something that would be useful for the community, but we also want to make sure that uh, this is a, a fruitful discussion in which we share a lot of ideas and brainstorm what can, what can be possible, what's going to happen. So today's chair is Nicholas Gutenberg. Um, he is, he's here with us, of course. Um, and uh, the format, like I said, is we're going to have a discussion, have a break, and then we're going to come back and maybe talk about next steps or 
really it's it's up to us. We're going to see how the discussion goes. So uh, with that, I'm going to share some links in the chat. And uh, these links are going to go, uh, sorry, YouTube, you're not going to see them. But this is just for the discussion participants so that they have access to the Google Doc where we're collecting some notes. So with that, I am going to hand it over to, to Nicholas. All right, thanks. Yeah, so the um, the idea I had for how this might go is that, you know, if outside of the the AI elements, I think hopefully everyone here does, you know, does things where they have some workflow and they have some way of going about or thinking about what they want to accomplish. And if we kind of understand that independent of the AI stuff, we can then sort of look at the gap between how the AI tools that are being made now are developed and what we actually are doing more naturally in, in just our, our process. So. The thought would be to basically just go around and, you know, everyone introduce themselves, um, say a few words about like what kind of uh, what kind of creative work you're interested in or and then, you know, how you how you go about doing what you do. Um, so I guess uh, if I have I have the list. Uh, I'll go from the bottom up. Um, so I think this is last name alphabetical order. No, it is not. It's just some random order. Tony. <laughs> You are you are first on my uh, on my on my order on my screen, so. Sure. So uh, most of the work I do is like AI research. I'm a PhD student, um, and right now I'm not really. I'm using kind of AI to help with more menial tasks, like drafting emails and letters and getting help with code. But I don't think I've and maybe like in a meeting, I remember I was in like a biology meeting I was sitting in on and I didn't understand some terminology. So I could quickly ask the system and I thought it was much fat. I asked ChatGPT and it was much faster than going on Google and looking. But I haven't really used it, I think, to come up with novel research directions or like synthesize ideas. Um, so like, how, so, do you, how do you come up with research directions? Like, um, a lot of the times it's like we're we're discussing someone pitches a potential project, and then everyone in the group kind of will like point out its like strengths and weaknesses, and then just like there will be like flashes of insight where you connect mm -hmm. it with something else. So I guess for me it's usually connecting one piece of work with something else and asking. Could we do something at the intersection? Yeah. Okay. Anything else you wanna you wanna add or comment or introduce to the table? Um I will say, okay, maybe maybe the the one I think the most creative thing I've done with AI is I'll write a long note document and I'll and then I'll ask it to summarize it from a particular point of view. Um I haven't tried I haven't actually done the ablation where I ask it just for a normal summary, but I felt like the times where I asked it from a particular point of view, like I think I asked it like, what are, what was the most important insight from our discussion from the hybrid perspective of Sam Altman and Xi Jinping, um, and then it, it it gave it gave something interesting. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So uh, Ryan then. Hi, yeah. Um, I'm a machine learning researcher and engineer, um, formerly like Adobe stuff. Um, but uh, in terms of like my like process, like with creative ML tools, um, I do a lot of like text image uh, work and I still use it for art, but I think that like that's kind of typical nowadays for people to do that kind of thing. Um, and like I, it's funny because like a lot of people, um, you know, doing ML are like talking about using LLMs, uh, large language models, to like supplement their coding and things like that. But I actually like haven't done that very much at all. Um, but I think that like one thing I've been doing lately is thinking about like different ways to move like my art from being. Um, more just like static imagery to being a little bit more interactive. Um, so I've just been, you know, 
think about thinking about ways that are almost like game design style stuff um, <laughs> that can like incorporate language models into uh, my work, like my artistic work in particular. So, um, yeah, that, I, I guess that's the that's the intro for me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Oneris then. I uh, so I I use creative AI in 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 like a twofold. So for for like writing code and stuff, I use it sometimes when I am doing something in a language I don't know, for example. Uh, I can, like, it, it's super convenient that you can write something in Python and then you need to do something in a different language and be like, uh, I, I first make sure that, that whatever model I'm using understand what it is. So I ask it like, hey, can you, can you please describe, can you please do the readme of this code? And, and it does like very good readmes. So then when I know it gets it, then can you do the same code in, I don't know, uh, Java, PHP, whatever. And, and that is, that is one way I do, but then because my background is in photography, uh, another another very nice uh, use I'm finding is uh, when I was uh, studying, learning about photography, one of my favorite photographers was Ansel Adams. And I always thought like he makes amazing photos because he's in the in the right place at the right time. But then studying his his craft, it turns out that he does everything is in the in the laboratory laboratory room, like in the dark room. So, so I still get sometimes that feeling of, oh, this photo is just good because he was in the right spot at the right time. But now with these generative tools, we can make that time and that spot ourselves up to, an, like, of course, up to a limit. So, so it really opens up the, the, crea like the, the creativity freedom that you can have to compose an image and like not have that excuse anymore. Like, if if your photo is not nice, you cannot say because you were not in the right place or whatever. Because like you can be anywhere, basically. Okay. Any other stuff you want to add or? Ah, uh, yeah. That's, okay, that's, <laughs> that's fine. So Olaf, <laughs> what's your creative process? That's a deep question. I, I wanted the other question. <laughs> what's your what, what's, what's my creative process? I don't know. Oh, yeah, what do you do? You know. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so, uh, I, um, so, so I guess I, I work with a research institute. Uh, it's called Cross Labs. You probably never heard about it. Um, I guess I, I, I do a bit of uh, academia and industry kind of stuff. Um, uh, a part of that is, I guess, a lot of meetings, reports, uh, emails, entering a meeting a bit late, but still having a transcript that you could read through. Um, and I guess I can summarize this stuff uh, to sort of streamline things. So that's been helpful for the, the text generation stuff. Um, yeah, I think that, that was that, that's pretty helpful. Is that creative, really? I guess a little bit. <laughs> um, well, like outside of AI, though, you know, when when you do something right. creative, like what's the process? What do you go through? How do you how do you think about it? How do you break it down? Yeah, for creative stuff, I think yeah, I I, I really li like myself drawing stuff. So I like to uh, uh, to sort of sketch, right? Yeah, uh, so sort of sort of graph things, and uh, and and I don't know. So so any any kind of process will involve me. Uh, with a notebook or or on on the iPad, so sort of sketching things, what people are saying, uh, what what yeah, what my thoughts are about them. Uh, draw draw a bunch of arrows, uh, scratch that, like we uh, like like put put something on top, things like this. Um, I think yeah, so some I guess there are some some tools that help that with that too. Um, I'm 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 just thinking now that the presentations that that I that I give uh, so at conferences or, or, or talks I give uh, I also do the same right I would I would have a bunch of things I want to say I put them on paper and then I draw arrows between them um, and now it became a bit a bit easier too I guess I can you can you can generate uh, uh, I guess illustrations very easily things like that I've been using that a lot um, for code. For code, it doesn't work for me. So I, I would I would use it for scripts, uh, things that would be you know reformatting data and, and, and things like that. But uh, it's not a creative thing to me yet. Uh, haven't found 
I tried to recreate <laughs> some, some of the code of my thesis. Uh, some of it worked fine. Maybe it found the code of my thesis online. Uh, <laughs> but then when I tried to add stuff that, was, that I found creative, that was rather difficult. Uh, OK, so th th those are a bunch of thoughts. OK. Um, yeah. Rather, I, I think the, the graphical side, like really like the plotting, trying to, to map, like what is it, uh, ha have a map of your mind on, 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 a, on paper or, 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 or somewhere, somehow you can, you can visualize it. That's something that I, uh, that I find the most helpful. And uh, yeah, in some way, some tools are helping right now with, with that, but not totally yet. All right. Anything else? Or... OK, Andy, then. Uh, Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, that's good. No, no, let's leave it there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, over to me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I I work in cybersecurity, um, and I've been actually well, I've been using mostly just um, language models for creativity purposes. Uh, I'm a writer, so I've been playing around with them in terms of uh, seeing how good they are um, to aid the creation of fiction, but but most of uh, what I've been playing around with these models um, to do has been around looking for malicious purposes for them. So, for instance, um, uh, at the end of last year, I did some research where I looked into how to use GPT three. Uh, for malicious uses such as like phishing, online harassment, the creation of fake news, disinformation, um, and also for persuasion, things like social validation, where you would um, try and create engagement around a piece of content in order to uh, boost it. And uh, you know, for instance, if you're trying to to, to run a scam or something like that. Um, one example uh, that I did in the research was. Uh, this old famous Tide Pod challenge, where uh, kids dared each other to eat um, those those things you put into the dishwasher, those uh, terribly toxic tablets, and so uh, we asked the model to create some tweets that uh, um, dared people to do that, and then we asked it to reply to those tweets, pretending to be people who who had done the challenge, uh, and you know to give their their um, experiences from from the challenge, and then. And then having the original post to reply back, you know, thanking them for doing the challenge and asking their friends to to uh, participate. Um, so yeah, that bit of research um, I published in January and actually I'm working on a follow up to that. So we're sort of looking deeper into into things like persuasion and also how to use the models to, for instance, profile people. So give it some information that we've, you know, pulled down from from their social network. And see what it says about them and how it might tailor things to them. We looked also at um, at uh, style transfer, so uh, capturing someone's writing style and then using that to, to craft emails of, of that person's writing style, which could be used for, for instance, phishing. Um, in addition to that, I've been exploring a little bit uh, recently AI safety and looking at GPT-4 and um, how it reacts to different situations, how it, um, what it thinks of the world, um, and looking for things that it might be good at that might be undesirable. For instance, I've I noticed that it's learned a lot from us humans about the creation of propaganda and disinformation. So it seems to be very good at doing that stuff just by default. Um, I'm still working on that. Uh, that side of the research. And then I've also been dabbling a little bit into looking at how uh, language models can be used for uh, creativity um, on like the technology and innovation side. So one experiment that I did that I I did share on, um, on the Cross Labs Discord was uh, about creating prompts where you ask the model to, to come up with um, a new idea, a new idea in machine learning, um, a new idea in re reinforcement learning, something like that, to explain what the idea is, to show proofs, to show code, to implement the idea, and then to like cross-examine the, um, the idea. Uh, and it actually came up with interesting things that I couldn't, 
couldn't immediately find as, as not being a novel. And I attribute that to, to the fact that these models have been trained on a great deal of uh, existing papers, right? There's a lot of stuff from archive, for instance, they would have been trained on. So they might actually be pretty good at coming up with um, short-term novel ideas that would be understandable and implementable by us and um, maybe something that nobody's thought about. So so an idea of, uh, sort of sparking, um, sparking innovation just at the cutting edge of where we are right now. Do you mind if I ask, you dropped something very quickly and then moved on, but you said you also write fiction? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so like when you're, when, when you're writing, um, when you're writing fiction, like how do you go about structuring that process for yourself or when you go about, you know, deciding on one of these research uh, areas as well? Because I, I guess I should say it, um, what I kind of wanted out of the first thing is like outside of the AI aspects, just like how do people work? How do people, you know, get inspiration? How do people um, actually get themselves to go into new spaces creatively or to, you know, conceptualize an idea and bring it to fruition? Because like, you know, the the AI of course puts a really heavy um, pressure on what that form would be because of what we can do with AI easily versus what's hard to do. But if we, I was kind of, or I kind of hope that like we can also talk about stuff that we do without AI so that we can kind of figure out how to make the AI stuff more um, compatible with our more natural creative process. Right, yeah, my process uh, is actually to um, come up with uh, like a, a very rough outline of what I'm writing, where I write like a bunch of bullet points, and then I, uh, it, it, that sort of tells the story from, from beginning to end. Um, and then I fill in detail and, of course, change things around and stuff. And, and for instance, like I've used AI to, you know, come up with um, people's names, names of companies, names of, you know, things uh, like, you know, if it's science fiction, science fiction for instance, you know, name, names of alien things. Um, I've uh, also try, tried it just in terms of like, I'll give it a portion of writing and then ask it to continue to see what it would have done. Mm -hmm. um, and it never was in line with what I was planning on doing. So, you know, but I just sort of <laughs> thought it would be interesting to see what it comes up with. It is very quite generic and, and derivative though. So I, um, I assumed that um, maybe that's just a function of it having learned from the, the sci-fi that it was in its training set, right? Um, yeah, so does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, oh, Anaris uh, wanted to, uh, let, let's read that uh, since we are actually broadcasting and I believe this came up that people don't see the, the messages. So Anaris, do you wanna say what you just posted? Yeah, so, so then I guess I missed your question, sorry about that. Uh, so like my creative process, at least when I'm taking photos, is to get into an uncomfortable place. Uh, uh, so for example, I don't take like my real photos when, when I'm in a place I am familiar with or a place I know, unless it is about subjects that is not, not necessarily people, but subjects that I am uncomfortable with or that are like alien to me. And I don't know, that's, that's like a quirk I have just to mm -hmm. like, yeah. Okay, thanks. Tanner, uh, since you joined, uh, we are in the process of sort of everyone is introducing themselves um, and sort of what kind of creative work that they do if they do, uh, you know, particular creative work or what's the creative process? How do they like to think uh, creatively and not necessarily, you know, how we use AI for that. It doesn't have to be about AI yet, um, but just sort of if there's anything particular about the, about, um, the actual process of being creative that you'd like to add to the table and then we'll we're going to go back around this and kind of discuss how to make uh you know maybe how ai could be more compatible with the the more natural creative process that we do versus you know us necessarily trying to fit our creative process to ai right uh how's my sound uh pretty good good yeah um right so uh certainly with creativity and the things i do right there's times and seasons um there's a time when I was writing. I have a trunk novel or two. Um, I put I put out a uh, an indie game in 2016 that I'm never going to let any of you find. Um, and I am a lapsed uh, jazz musician as well. 
Um, what, one of the big things that kind of kind of teeters back and forth a little bit, uh, especially in the writing uh, world, is this uh, the, the, the colloquial term is pantsing versus, versus planning, which is kind of how much you want to beforehand like outline everything and then go in and like slowly add bits of resolution, right? There's methods like Snowflake or a whole bunch of others where you start with it with this this meta view and then you slowly add resolution versus pantsing, which is a lot more just I just have a general idea or a feel for things and then I write and then I let the story or the characters of the story tell me what's realistic and what should happen next. Uh, the very different approach is I lean a little bit more pantsing, even though I want to be a planner because I find myself continually dissatisfied with the plans uh, because they don't reflect what's actually happening on the ground, so to speak. And I think that that different that opposition of paradigm uh, is really interesting, not just in general uh, creative processes, but especially when we add the AI element to it. it. Does it help you? Yes, and with your improvisational approach, does it help you plan things and then fill in the gaps for your plan, right? Maybe you do the high level and then you fill it in, but uh, that would be an angle that I would suggest looking at. It's something you see also in jazz with things that are composed entirely ahead of time versus things that might be improvised uh, in like full on solos can be improvised, but even just the way you play something in a more subtle way, and this extends to all forms of music, can vary a little bit from session to session or from who you're playing with. So, so it's that immediate in the moment versus ahead of time structure sort of thing, I think is interesting. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me get my list. So I think, uh, well, I'm now at Alyssa, which is probably I should start to go through uh, people who are actually physically in Kyoto. So Alyssa, it's, I think it's your turn. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, um, I tend to use AI. Well, I guess like my creative process is, is very, um, I try to unconstrain myself and I like my, my process is being very much like being in the moment and sort of responding to exactly what I want to do in that moment. Um, and a lot of that comes down to uh, exploring a lot of like strange art and going to very strange places or not even strange places, just going out and doing things. Like I really like collecting experiences. Um, and why that's really important to me for um, uh, a creative process is because I feel like it fills my my head with all sorts of unexpected information. And the unexpected information gets translated in fun and unexpected ways um, through like science or music or art or whatever I happen to be working on um, or focused on at the time. So, but for AI, I, I mostly use it for uh, entertainment. Um, so, I really enjoy Twitch um, generated uh, AI shows such as the infinite steamed hams. Really like that skit. It's, uh, I find it really funny and I tune in and I watch an, an iteration or two. Um, and I also really enjoyed the Seinfeld a parody when they had it. And that was really fun. But before that they, that they were doing that, I really enjoyed com comedians on Twitter who were saying that, I fed a bot 10,000 hours of Olive Garden commercials and I asked it to write a script. I would just read those for so long um, just because I think they're so funny and they're, it, it, it's very surreal and I enjoy surrealism a lot because it's like this strange, unexpected information. Um, but I guess in terms of like actually using it for writing, um, I have attempted to use it for you know, saying like, OK, here's a sort of a paragraph, please finish it. And, you know, it never finishes. It, you know, it, I've always been really disappointed so far with the text output that I get. So, so far, its use has mostly been constrained to summarizing ideas or maybe rephrasing ideas or basically acting like a really fancy thesaurus, I think, is the, the, the main thing that I use it for these days um, in terms of I do use it for image generation if I'm making a PowerPoint and or a talk and I really just want it. I want like a generic strange picture of something. I'll just go to stable diffusion on hugging face and just hit refresh a bunch of times until I see something I like. <laughs> but to be honest, that's that's the really the only things I use it for right now. Um, I'm still waiting for 
I guess I'm still waiting for something different to happen um, before I feel like it can be a part of um, actually generating things other than strange information that I find inspiring. But I think there's a lot of value there too. So I, I wouldn't want that to go away anytime soon. All right, thanks. Uh, so Madi. Oh, thank you. So my experience in using AI in creative way Mm, in terms of research, uh, when I was working on, you know, cybersecurity attacks, <clears throat> I use AI for attacking on AI. So what I did in model inversion attack, I use, you know, deep generative models for attacking to deep face recognition systems. So it for me was very creative because we were using AI, the deep generative models for, you know, in very focused way, narrowing the search space instead of having a huge search space of faces with a lot of dimensions. We're using generative models for reducing the search space to just a small vectorial space. <clears throat> so we could see that, you know, the result was too much different with that generative model or without that generative model inside the inversion attack loop. Uh, apart from research, you know, in my editorial activities, recently I'm using a lot, you know, AI, especially chat GPT, when I want to somehow, but partially, to, you know, to help, you know, for example, uh, rephrasing something, you know, improving the quality partially. But what I noticed, you know, AI is very strong and apart from its own creativity, how to use AI is another thing. We can use AI in a very creative way. So something that it has strong potential of creativity inside we can use it also with a lot of creativity you know for example in chat gpt first you can put some term conditions term and conditions for it you know remember do this do this do this you know and we put the conditions then by considering those conditions the chat gpt will follow exactly what we want from it for example, like what I did for rephrasing a text, and it was very successful because I had some evaluation systems beside, and it was the result was amazing. Thank you. All right, thanks. So I think next is Luke. Yeah. So for me, uh, well, the only creation I do for the moment is in research. Um, but basically the process, since I have an engineering background, usually is trying to find the overall question, then break that down into smaller parts and, and then finding solution to the smaller parts to build back up. Uh, but the way in which I try to get to the overall question is, well, I would say the old fashioned way. Um, basically reading uh reading stuff on the internet and when i say stuff it's to say not just papers but also uh, random articles uh, random opinions um yeah talking with people i i do like um finding uh communities either on discord or reddit or whatever uh, starting a debate but having no stake in the debate so just listening to people's opinion and ideas because for me it's quite interesting to catch these different ideas so um and, and, and find what is uh what is the link between the different ideas if there is a link and then finding um is there an, an obvious answer to each of the ideas or each of the questions that the different people in the debate ask Correct. and if not well that might be a a question that uh, you can answer or that you can share your opinion on and, and 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 maybe go into details as to why uh this opinion is uh well how you can support this opinion i would say rather than being the right one 
so the the only way I would say I use uh, non-human help um, and at the moment is in in the form of search engines. So to find the tools to help me, um, well, write a program or um, what kind of papers might be uh, supporting a diff uh, a specific topic. Uh, if I already have the overall question, what might be the interesting papers? Do you know what? people have already done in the past, so I don't repeat what's already been done. So yeah, for, for me, that's the the only way for the moment where I'm using technology because yeah, uh, pictures, uh, music and some stuff like that. So I, I consume that in, in my free time or uh, when I'm programming to, to have uh, something to listen to in the background, but I'm not necessarily interested in producing uh, music for myself. So yeah, that's about it. All right, thanks. Uh, so Martin. Yeah, I I guess, I mean, I don't use AI yet. I don't know how to use it. I tried it a few times, didn't work. Um, so I, but I guess my, my process is, um, so I have this kind of, I have kind of, this one research question that I want to solve, and it's not really changed in over a decade. Um, and so basically what I try, I always just try to solve this problem. And, um, but I mean, over time, obviously, I had to try many different things because the first thing didn't work. I mean, I still don't know what works. Um, but yeah, basically, I try different approaches. I don't know, I run into them somehow. Over time, I meet people, I talk to them, and then I hear new things, and then sometimes they sound promising, and then I, and then I, I guess what I then do is I, I try to get as far as possible, as far as I can with this, like go with it, I don't know, make some assumptions, or like have some kind of, yeah, it's like basically come up with some theory of what could be a solution, and then I just try to go as far as possible uh, first, I guess in some way by myself, but then of course, then I, I read something, I look some stuff up. Then I again try to get as far as possible. And then at some point I get kind of stuck, usually. Um, or maybe also multiple times in between, I get really stuck. And then, but like that's a good, in a, in a way that's always where you, I want to be in the end. I want to kind of know, like sometimes I, I know what I have to do to get, like I, I have like a lot of work to do because I'm not yet stuck, but it's just like things where I know if I keep doing this, I there's still progress to be made, but then, so basically I have to always keep, keep doing these things. And then at some point I will be actually stuck and like I will not know anymore what to do. And then that's where I guess in the end, that's that's the place where con creativity is kind of needed. But then what I do is I just wait. <laughs> <laughs> then I just do other stuff, whatever. Then there's maybe something else I can do. Because like there's nothing really I can do then at that point. Like I'm just stuck. I, like, I don't know. But then like if I'm lucky, then the answer just pops up into my head. And sometimes that's the next day. Sometimes it will take a year. It's like, uh, yeah, I don't know how to get this, this uh, how to describe this much more. I think that's kind of like if I actually manage to go to the edge, then usually, actually, I usually it, I can solve the problem. I mean, sometimes it still takes a long time, but it's it's kind of that's the like the the process is kind of get to the edge of what I understand and. Uh, and also what I can understand with what's on the internet and stuff like this. And then, then it's just hope from there on. <laughs> waiting for creativity. Yeah, I'm waiting for age. some magic, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. I guess, uh, I guess I'll go. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say about what I do. I, uh, most of what I'm gonna talk about is actually my hobbies, but it's not completely uh, disconnected from research, um, but you know, I, I do do some research, but I also do things like write uh, tabletop systems. I, I also wrote an indie uh, computer game uh, back in 2012, just before I went to Japan. I don't know. Um, 
and I've done a bit of music and uh, I've also, I guess I have to say that I've done a bit of art because I got paid for it, but I think somehow I don't associate that. It's, it's actually, that was closer to my research stuff. Um, but I, I guess like the, the common thread is usually I'm thinking about the systems that underlie things and then let things emerge from the way that the system sets up, um, you know, what's kind of natural, what flows from it. And there's a couple of different things that I'll do. Um, one that seems to work and another that I do more often, but it almost never works, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the thing that seems to work is I just look for impossibilities or like tensions. So I look for something where I should be able to do two things, but there's no way that I can uh, understand how I would get from doing the one thing to doing the other. So like if, I, if I'm talking about a physics uh, system, I'll look for some parameter where I think I know what the parameter does when it's really big. And I think I know what happens when it's really small, but those two things can't like they don't fit in my head like they should smoothly go from one to the other and then i kind of force it to smoothly go from one to the other and then usually something will break and then that will tell me that there's something new that i have to understand and then i can kind of go from there so i'm kind of trying to create these tensions or these impossibilities um and i use the same stuff in tabletop game uh design and also if i'm like designing a campaign or something i'll set i won't like plot out events or anything like that or npcs i will just try to have the entire setting ask a question that's like fundamentally hard to answer something where like it's really necessary to answer it if you're in that setting it's going to be important but i can't answer it um but i can also say like that it, it's going to get answered one way or another and then when i find that sort of impossibility then usually it's very easy to have interesting things happen decorating it as you know the players will go through the process of, of finding their answer to that question so like you know i could say okay what if i have a what if i have a setting where there are fundamental resources which are decaying in a way that you just can't get them back. Um, you know, the the one that I did was that the afterlife was getting overpopulated, that there was only so much space, but people were still dying and the souls were indestructible. So there's this tension that like, you know, you, you have a finite space and this continuing amount of new stuff that's going in there and none of those things will stop. So what happens, right? And then from there, you can get an entire setting and an entire game. Um, you know, I, I can also ask myself the question when I'm building the system. So I can say like, okay, normally I would assume when I have like a tabletop RPG that it's important that, you know, the 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 game be balanced and that the power that each character brings to the table is somehow, you know, controlled and things like that. What if I just don't do that? What if I make all the all of the characters by default omnipotent, but I don't tell the players that? What's gonna happen? Like, since I can't imagine it, then if I go and do it, something interesting will happen and then I can discover something new. Um so that's that's the thing that tends to work for me uh, when I do it, when I have something I don't know what's going to happen, or I, I engineer a case where I make myself unable to know what's going to happen and then kind of force myself into that space. Um, the thing that I do a lot more often that doesn't work is I'll get inspired by reading, like reading fanfic or looking at other things or playing other systems, and I'll find something about it that bothers me. Like, this is almost right, but there's something a little off. And then I'll find the thing that makes everything kind of snap into place and make sense to me. But then the thing is like, what I find for my own process is whenever I do that, it's very, it's satisfying when I come up with the idea, but I completely lose the will to execute it somehow. So with the things that are impossible questions, I'm usually driven to actually go and ask the question and it bothers me until the question has been asked. But with these things where there's this kind of resonance and something just makes sense, I find more and more that like, I'll, satisfy myself with it but then i won't actually have that kind of driving need to express it in the world in any form um which yeah i don't know like maybe that's still enough because it still gets me somewhere <laughs> somewhere that's only in my own head um then it, it actually kind of becomes uninteresting to express in, in in some kind of weird way um so i think that's about what i could say about my own process um or processes. Yeah, there's, you know, also I, I agree with a lot of the stuff that's been said, like the the pants <laughs> pants method and, and things like that. I'm more of a pantser than a planner um, with this kind of thing, which I guess also comes from the systems level stuff um, as well. Being more, I'm more, much more comfortable setting up a system and letting it tell me what happens than than saying what happens, or then expressing like a particular image or a particular sound or a particular song or piece of text. Um, but yeah, uh, that's it for me. So I think at this point, 
Um, let's take like, you know, another 10, 15 minutes. And, and if anyone has anything they want to discuss about what we've heard so far, well, we won't do it in order or anything like that. I mean, raise your hand if, if it gets chaotic, but if not, just like, we'll, we'll see how well we can, uh, we can self-organize there. And then we'll take a short, like maybe a 10 minute coffee break and then try to figure out yeah, how to make these things work with AI or how to make AI work better with these things. Yeah, maybe I, there's one thing I would like to use AI for, which is I would like, what I would like to be able to do is like give it a paper or something like this. Uh, like for me, it's mostly yeah, like a math paper <laughs> um, mm -hmm. that I don't understand or that I don't know really what it's about. And it kind of requires lots of math that I don't know or that I'm unfamiliar with, or at least I'm unfamiliar with the language they use and the kind of, or like even the symbols. And I can, I could ask it, can you tell me in, in terms I understand? So maybe I have to give it some other papers that I understand or something. I have to, I have to kind of inform it somehow what I understand. But can you like express in, in terms that I understand, uh, give me a summary in terms, in the terms that I understand, because that would be, I think then, like if it if it could like specifically talk in in this language that I understand well, I think that would be amazing. Like, uh, that, yeah. like yeah. if it could also because it, it could kind of ex, in that case it could kind of exploit all the things that I uh, already learned also, which is uh, which it doesn't do at the moment. I mean. Do you think that AI can create maths? Yeah, yeah, I think it would. I mean, I think it probably already did in some way. I mean, maybe not nothing special, but uh, I think. I mean, that yeah. advanced mathematics. Yeah, yeah, I think it will. I think it will totally. Passing the edge that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think it will. I think it maybe it's not doing this yet, but. Like my my attempts to use it for uh, telling me proofs didn't really work yet. Uh, it makes mistakes, so it's kind of, and that's of course gonna get hard for me. Like if the proofs are hard, so I only asked it about simple proofs that I kind of uh, I could tell that they were wrong. But if I ask them about ask it about hard proofs, then I'm at some point not gonna be able to tell anymore whether it's right or wrong, and then it's kind of useless if it's not, if it's not definitely right. <laughs> so, so, but I think still it will like, it will still uh, happen that it will be used for creating math. I think I, I have no doubt really that it will do this. I mean, an example of not, not necessarily creating math, but creating novel solution can, can be found in uh, alpha zero, which, well, basically suggested new strategies or new ways of playing Go or playing chess. So I, I don't see why we couldn't at some point go from this yeah. uh, similarly simple example to creating new math because yeah. basically it's just manipulating concepts. Or, it's like a, it's a game actually. In yeah. a way you can see like proving theorems is like a game. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you, yeah, have, okay. you, you have the basic concept of math and you just, well, just uh, reassemble them to, to have a new proof. So yeah, it's yeah, the, yeah. the same idea. Yeah. There's like legal moves and illegal moves. And if you can, if you can get to the goal by using only legal moves, then you win the game. Yeah. yeah that's, that yeah. works. Yeah. yeah. Explainable methods. Is, is finding the path, uh, you know, for, to prove or disprove a statement, uh, the most useful thing for, what, like you described earlier that there are things where you get stuck and there are things where you get seriously stuck. Are the kinds of things that unstick you like the ability to prove things or is it like, you know, more of an ontological thing where you decide that you're interested in a different quantity or you want to measure a different thing or something else makes more sense for the kind of um, thing you're trying to explain? Yeah, I guess it can be. I think it can be proofs 
because sometimes I just want the proof. <laughs> uh, sometimes you just want to know, like, is this statement true? And if it's true, then you can basically build on it and maybe get like interesting, uh, it can give you like interesting uh, results or then you can kind of, but like if, you, if you're not sure that this statement is true, then you're gonna, like you can still build, like you can still look at what would be the consequences, but you're, you're gonna have this nagging doubt and it's very, that's actually very tough to <laughs> deal with in my opinion. Like it's kind of, when you're sure, when you, when you have the proof, basically you have so much more confidence to keep going. And so that's why sometimes you just want to prove, I think. Um, but yeah, of course, sometimes the, the problem is like some more conceptual thing where I don't even have, I don't have a theorem that I need proven. I have, I'm like stuck because I, there's like, it doesn't like something doesn't work. I don't have the right concept or something to, uh, make progress. And then, then yeah, I, then I don't know. I mean, then, yeah, then I don't, I don't really know. I mean, it's hard also. Yeah. Maybe I need, I would need to come up with an example of this. I, I have to think about it. I don't know if I can find one. Yeah, but it's, you know, sorry. Yeah, it strikes me that this sounds a lot and, 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 you know, Mahdi at least and Andy brought up, um, uh, I guess, uh, security and it sounds like a paradigm of cryptography that some things are by nature uh asymmetric some are very symmetric i feel like we we brought up different examples here that uh so some some of us seem to for the creative process want to do the exploration and then leave the exploitation for for others to in their response right uh in your group or the ai right uh, and in some, so for some, it's the opposite. So I'm, I'm thinking, um, uh, so maybe in, I don't know, in music, uh, I'm happy to, to launch an, a new idea. So, so it's, it's pretty symmetric to me. So I like to, to launch a new idea. And then, you know, if, if you, Im, you do music improv, then someone is going to, to make it work and it's fine. And but I also enjoy really, okay, okay. I, I just heard this, this made no sense, but let me try. Okay. This sounds a bit like. Uh, the sound of music and 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 and, and make this work like this or so so, so uh, I enjoy both both directions. I think for math it's very asymmetric uh, in yeah in in terms of I guess my personal difficulty my my perspective of things very tough to prove to 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 check that a proof is a proof. Uh, you know if you, if you are a Perelman or a wh whoever and you send me a proof or a famous conjecture. I, I, I might I might spend years uh, things like this. Whereas um, I guess image generation is immediate. Oh, okay, yeah, this this feels right. Like I I, I like this, right? Like it's for design. So so that there depending on the problem, depending who you are, which which what what you enjoy also. Uh, so there is a perspective there. Um, so it sounds a lot like cryptography to me, right? Like so so it sounds like so it sounds like the, there is a yeah the, there is one sign that is very easy. The other side is is computationally tough or painful. <laughs> I don't know what you think about that, but yeah, M maybe we, we we have different perspectives here, but it does depend. Maybe there's something by nature in the problems. Yeah, I I think that something that strikes me is like, you know, when you're solving some problems creativity that creativ creatively, um, there is like one solution sometimes, like whether or not something is a proof is like boolean it's like either true or not and then there are problems like image generation where it's like mapping from one you know text to um whatever set of images is kind of an inverse problem where you could imagine basically you know like functionally as many images as you could think of could fit a specific text so i think that like it's interesting because you know it, um like in terms of which type of problem like a like a one you know correct solution and a kind of a, a less bounded problem i think that my first impulse is to think that like ml is better at the um set of problems that have many flexible kind of solutions but then i also think like well the point of you know chess is like i mean well and, and, and so the with the 
with thinking about chess in particular, it's like there are multiple solutions, but there's like there aren't that many optimal solutions, I guess. So I I almost feel like it like Alpha Zero feels like almost a different thing from a lot of the um, deep learning tools that like I'm familiar with, and it's just kind of interesting to see that contrast where it's like um, discovering a set of like optimal moves in chess feels so qualitatively different from discovering like different uh, solutions for representing a prompt or representing an image with text. So it's kind of interesting to contrast those two. Yeah, I mean, I think you can move, there's a spectrum there and they kind of, they differ in how the sort of the intuitive deep learning bits are used. So like in image generation, uh, or at least like in, in GAN image generation, you just directly intuit the image, right? And you know now we have some iterative ones uh, that are a little more complicated, but basically you're, you're still just extracting the output from following the behavior of the deep learning bit. Um, but there's this whole other set of problems where the solutions are verifiable. I mean, this gets to what Olaf said about asymmetry. Um, and when you have these verifiable things, of course, everything that a neural network directly outputs will be wrong because neural networks are never precise. Um, but if you were to search that through some other method, that would be very slow because you'll generate a lot of things that aren't even like aren't even in the right direction. Um, so if you don't use the neural network to just output the answer, but use the neural network to output the sort of proposals for how to move towards the answer, use it to generate your gradient essentially, and then you use you know classic search um, then you've converted in some sense the paradigm of the sort of generative like one shot intuition driven thing where you will always have some error in your answer, but it's okay if you're using it on things where you can have a whole manifold of possible answers that are kind of plausible or good. Um, now, the fact that the neural network is imprecise doesn't matter anymore because you are using a standard search, which can be exact if you have an exact criteria or it's an optimization problem and you get as far as you get. Um, so in some in some sense, you kind of uh, pivot to take advantage of what the neural network is good at and to hide what it's bad at. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of stuff like that. Like that that's the kind of thing that in some sense, if we know what we want, the I feel like the engineering to make a composite system or a hybrid system to do that thing is not necessarily so hard. The hard thing is actually knowing what we want. Yeah, like I feel like you get um, like you were saying, you kind of can take the neural network that will, you know, usually imprecisely be in the ballpark and narrow the solution space. I think someone mentioned that kind of idea. Like, if you know what you want, you can at least narrow it down to something that's uh, viably searchable with traditional methods and uh, take advantage of that. Versus, yeah, so like, you know, it, and it's interesting. Um, to think about with creativity, like a lot of the time, I feel like, I mean, I guess it just varies so much. Like when we talk about creativity, you know, there's some, we're, we're, we're really, I feel like loosely talking about, and, and I think there was a workshop like yesterday on what creativity actually is. So I should probably watch that recording when it comes out. But like, I feel like it's talking about so many different things and that can encapsulate things where it's like, we know there is one, solution that's optimal or we know there is some manifold of solutions that are viable. So yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, the curious thing about the search versus the generation is that in some sense, um, search is a way of pulling information out of nothing. Whereas the usual things that involve just using a neural network straight out, that you're always doing mutual information kind of structures where you have something that gives you information about something else, but the information is actually in the data. Um, so like in that sense, if you have, you know, when you talk about something like AlphaGo, it's capable of discovering moves that were unseen in, you know, uh, that were unseen when people started to train AlphaGo, right? Because it's essentially doing, it has a search component, so it can actually create information or it can extract information out of the sort of infinite space represented by the system of Go. Um, similarly, like you could do the same thing if you had a, uh, you know, a neural network looking for patterns of glider guns in Conway's game of life or something like that, right? Like any, any of these things where there is this kind of external oracle that tells you what's the consequence of the thing you came up with and then you do it a search, that kind of thing is capable of creating, uh, creating information, whereas the sort of inference-driven thing can't. Um, 
I don't know where that puts us on creativity because creating information is not the same as like human creativity, but that's something I think that can be, uh, it's it's relevant as far as whether the system can surprise you or how the system surprises you. I mean, I, I if I wanted to stick my neck out, I'd say this is probably part of the reason why it's easier to find, like why things like diffusion, um, it's easier to be surprised than with GANs a little bit. Because with, I, I don't know how, how strictly I want to say that, because GANs are also a sort of uh, search thing in the way that they're trained. Um, but the iterative nature of diffusion means that diffusion can kind of like get itself stuck in a way that doesn't have anything to do with this training data. Right, so, like it, so it can be forced to complete something that that is just really alien to it. OK, and I see. And then that's the same. Is that also the same with large language models? I mean, do you, are you saying that large language models, are, are they for you on the search side? To a degree, I mean, so you say stable, like diffusion, stable diffusion is on the search side to a certain degree. Um, I would say that one iteration of diffusion is on the on the standard inference side, but the fact that you then iterate it so that you feed its output back to its input, and then that can take it off manifold, right? Since you have no guarantee that the errors that it makes are going to actually keep it on the same. Uh, probability distribution that was generated artificially during training um, in order to train it. So that it can kind of get itself off into the woods and it still does things when it's off in the woods, which is, you know, um, mm -hmm. one way that you can get it to express surprising things, let's say. Uh, with large language models, you know, inferring the next character is just the standard inference process kind of stuff. But if you iterate, then in principle, you can have it be search. Uh, it's just like if you iterate in a, in a way that you just take the next character and feed it back on the input, then that's kind of operating in the way that's kind of minimally like search because that's, it, it's as you train it, it'll be less and less off distribution. But now let's say as you're generating these characters, you are doing something like feeding that into a, into a, a web browser and then taking the output and feeding it back into the language model or you're feeding it into a compiler and taking the output of the program and feeding it back into the language model or even you're generating you know, a bunch of candidates and selecting between the candidates uh, due to some external test, you know, some external consideration, that moves it in the direction of search. But I, I think it's really, it's a continuum. Like you can use these things in either way. Well, and like one thing to call out with large language models is in a sense, like we're not like, I mean, we're not greedy sampling from the models, right? So like we still are kind of doing this thing where we're introducing the stochasticity into it like when if we were to take gpt whichever and just greedy sample it's way lower quality in terms of um at least like a conversational um system so like yeah it, yeah it's interesting to think about um and and to your point with diffusion I, I i like the point of you know you have this kind of most of the time like compounding error that really can make it so that even though you're refining, you're like, um, with a GAN, it's like, yeah, you're going to get like, well, I mean, with GANs, it's hard to compare because like the stability still feels so low that like, I feel like that's kind of bottlenecking it a bit. But I, I agree that like with diffusion, you end up getting this iterative process, but it also iterates in ways where it is kind of going off into the woods, which I hadn't considered that you're not just like getting better outputs, you're getting like sometimes weirder outputs. Yeah, I mean the the stochasticity is definitely it's like that's a search that's a search operation or not, Nicholas? What do you, I mean? It seems to me that like stochasticity is actually definite. Like is the like the most basic or simple, but it's a search operation. Like it's, well, for me, the thing that makes it search is that you have some kind of oracle that then feeds back on the output. Um, and in diffusion, it's it's like, that's why I was kind of feeling like I was sticking my neck out because the Oracle is also the, the diffusion model, but it's the same way that like a dynamical system can have feedbacks that lead to attractors and things like that, that in the linear, um, you know, when you linearize that system, it just looks like, okay, it just, it does this pretty predictable thing. But when you apply that, you know, pretty simple operation a billion times, then suddenly you get weird, um, you know, this is this is probably getting off into the woods of stuff that if you're not familiar with complex systems, dynamical systems, or physics, it's not helpful. 
Um, but like one of the, I, I guess I'll say it simply because it is an interesting thing. Like one of the kind of, for me, mysteries in physics that was really mind blowing is how does infinity happen? Um, because there are all of these theorems in physics of like, in, in a finite uh, system, you can't have a phase transition. So like um, the, the formal definition of a phase transition is that you have the sort of distribution of states and it splits into two distributions and you can't get from the one to the other through a natural process. So like if I have, if the universe is made of ice, then there is no, the probability is actually zero in an infinite universe that that ice will become water through thermal. In, a finite, in, uh, so, in, in what? Infinite or finite? Um, yeah, it's get, it gets a bit tricky, right? But like in an infinite time, basically, uh, it depends how you take the, the limits, right? But it, it's, it's exponentially suppressed with the system size. So in the end, the system size is going to win unless you do some really funky things with scaling time. Um, but like this is exactly the thing, right? You're, 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 you're taking something where you start from something where you, your assumption is every state is equally occupied or like is, is visited eventually with equal probability given infinite time. That's the ergodicity hypothesis. And then the math actually tells you, no, that's not true. So you start from something where the math says like, this is my axiom. And then the end is, you know, your axiom is false, but that only happens in this infinite limit. So the, the process of iterating physics and, and, you know, going, to infinite time, going to infinite space, it somehow fundamentally changes the structure of the system in a way you can actually still like talk about and predict, but it brings in something new that wasn't there before. And that's that's the metaphor I would use to talk about like the iteration and something like stable diffusion is that an individual step of the diffusion process is really well characterized and it can be really well trained, but it's extremely hard to know based on like how, what is the, the mean squared error of predicting the noise of the, you know, whatever nth step how is that going to relate to the actual attractor uh, structure of the trained model? Because the attractors are all this kind of infinite limit thing. So they're like, phase, it's like phase transitions between, you know, different, different kind of subspaces of elements of the images that come out. Um, and that falls into the kind of language that people use in physics to talk about things like emergence. So that, mm. but like, I think diffusion is kind of the point where it's really, it's not 100% clear to me that it's a good example of search because there's no external oracle, right? Whereas in something like, in something like a language model, like the instruct GPT formalism or something like that, right? There is an external oracle, which is the human users who say which message that they like more. Or, you know, in an interactive session, the external oracle is the human who's interacting with GPT and then deciding based on what GPT says where to drive it next. Uh, whereas in diffusion, the oracle is the thing itself I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and so so basically, in this in the chat, if you do chat GPT with a human, then basically, you can take it arbitrarily far away from uh, distribution, basically, maybe over yeah. time. I mean, yeah, there's of course there's this kind of length limit of the tokens or whatever, but okay, if we ignore that. Yeah, and I mean the way that people hack GPT kind of shows this, right? Like. You know, you, you can think that you've set the distribution that you're operating in as it's not all that hard to go and get it to do something unexpected. Mm. So so it, it does depend a lot, it seems, on the nature of the stuff that makes you happy uh, as a result of the process of this exchange, right? So, so sometimes you know what you're looking for, then you don't know, just see see when you, you, you when you see it. And what what you what you have in front of you is a generator. So either you know in an A life simulation, you, you know you, you might know exactly what you want to see. You want to see a pattern that corresponds to co cooperation, something. So it's part of, you you are doing the this pattern recognition on the result, and it's pretty immediate. Uh, if you have replicators, you see them. If you have you know uh, stuff like that, but sometimes you don't know what you're looking for. And I feel like that's the part that Martin might be in in his question, for example. He, he might not see it, although it's right there. Um, so this, this sort of, uh, I don't know what it is, right? It's going to, 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 to transform the, this, this space into, you know, like, I don't know, cr create this manifold uh, that wasn't visible before. There, there's something about it being, it's, so I, I'm not sure about the phase transition because of this, right? So, so maybe you don't have this, you, 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 or you didn't trans you transform the space in a way that you have an order parameter that makes it obvious. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's, 
That's the hard, yeah. like everything that I've done where it's been really hard and, and you've seen, like I've seen entire fields of study stuck for, you know, 60 years. They've never been about, we don't know how to prove this thing or like, we don't know how to measure this thing. They're always about, we don't actually know what it is we want. That, that's mm -hmm. always the problem. That's right. Like so origin of life, origin consciousness, of all of it. It's it's like, what is life? Yeah. What is consciousness? If people ask that question every single conference, you know, every year for, for decades and decades and decades and no one ever gets anywhere because we don't know what we want from those things necessarily. And like, yeah, something that would actually tell us how, or it would help us know whether or not something is the thing we want or how to find what it is we actually want. That would be kind of a big deal. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that's what also, that's what I'm looking for in these models is I really want something to give a suggestion on what it is I should be looking for. I mean, really, I want something to come up with. I, w I really want something to act as a second brain a little bit, like something that is a little bit uh, can do maybe parallel thinking while I'm thinking about one part. It's also thinking about another part and it's coming like it's coming up with ideas and suggestions and goals. It's much like I would. Um, but I'm not really sure if, I mean, that's obviously a super tall order. <laughs> that's a big ask, but um, I don't really know what that would look like, I guess. No idea. It, it does sound a lot like, oh, so, so, so my, my brain is so, 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 so complex. I'm trying to, to, to understand things. It's, it's too messy. I can't make anything up. No, I create another brain exactly like mine, and this is going to make everything <laughs> Oh, yeah, maybe what it is is maybe I want some maybe I want an external brain to organize my brain, perhaps. Mm. You know, I guess yeah. like maybe what I'm looking for is I'm looking for some technology assist to guide my thinking and to organize my thoughts. Like if if I were to think about technology in maybe 20 years, maybe some wearable device or something. I don't know. Like maybe it's saying. Oh, hey, Alyssa, I noticed that every time you uh, work on this particular task, you get extra sleepy. How about, it, like, maybe it suggests that you don't like doing that task, or maybe it suggests that you should be spending time doing something like this. I really want something to say something that is, oh, I hadn't noticed that, or I hadn't thought about that before, because my brain's so busy thinking about all these disorganized thoughts. I want something else to come in and make sense of it for me. <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of complicated. Maybe the parallel brain will push you to do it more, you know, because the way that you explain the parallel brain is something very similar to your own brain yeah. and doing same activities, but in much better way. So maybe push you more to be more drowned in what you are doing. <laughs> <laughs> that would be terrible. <laughs> I I think that someone um, I think they were at OpenAI um, was tweeting about how like they wanted this system that would tell them where their keys were and I was like honestly like that would be kind of nice like a lot of the things are not like a lot of the things that I want are like kind of like you said like noticing things that I miss um, or that I like like observing things that I'm missing especially in terms of like when I'm engrossed in other things, but like then we kind of run into this like, well, people probably have a hard time trusting uh, any system to collect that much of their lives, and like I, I definitely wouldn't. But I think the like punchline to the tweet was like um, that they wouldn't like trust any company to make it, but maybe they'd like to open source, like watch me all day and tell me where I left my keys and things. But it, it is kind of like interesting. Um, because like one thing that I think people note about it is that when the models fall short, a lot of the time it's not because they're like doing what was like not expected of them. It's because they were falling into modes like they were doing exactly what we would have expected of them, but like it's boring. And so I think that one thing that comes up a lot with these models is like we want them to stay on manifold, but we also want them to like do things that are interesting. and. I don't think those are always like an intrinsic tension, but um, it's hard to make something that is doing things correctly, but also doing them in a way that's interesting. So it's, yeah, it's, it's something that like text image people think a lot of, a lot about, especially because 
like you can follow the text prompt, but if you want to follow it correctly, it's harder to get high fidelity. So, and, and I think you can also see this with like large language models and um, writing things that are interesting, but like correct. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, Tanner had a uh, comment in the chat. Should I read it? I can, I can paraphrase it. Okay. Um, because I, I do find a lot of this um, interesting and also perhaps uh, seductive in a way. But um, part of what I think about, especially because uh, in, in my day job, I spend a lot of time extracting and soliciting expert knowledge from people that work in complex systems, uh, people and technology together, long story. Uh, but a lot of this also sounds like something that just a close collaborator would do. Like if there's two people working on something that's very similar. Um, and and that's not to discount this, it's it's valuable. But when we think about introducing these tools that become a little bit more active, that feel a little bit more like agents, we uh, are moving into a space where we need to think about how do we collaborate with them and what does collaboration look like rather than just use, um, precisely because this dynamic is starting to shift. Um, and uh, right, so so the, the tongue in cheek comment was, um, can can a person do this? Um, but similarly, touching on some of the conversation we've had as well, there's been a little bit of the machine can do this better and the person can do this better. And discussions about what machines can do better and people can do better uh, have been going on for decades. Um, and uh, that's not to say that they're not been meaningful, uh, right? The 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 most famous one is called Fitz List. Um, he came up Fitz, forgot his full name came up with a list of things that humans are good at and things that machines are good at. And you should task all of these kinds of tasks to the machines and all of these kinds of tasks to the humans. And it turns out it's not quite that straightforward, um, but the conversation is still worth having. It is where do things fit? When you look at um, collaboration across multiple agents, um, when they're humans, you see uh, an establishing of what's called common ground. When you're establishing a joint activity and there's a basic compact of that may or may not be explicit about um, there's some shared goals. Maybe people are subsuming certain goals to get to a collaborative goal. Um, what you're going to do to repair repair your understanding of the situation if if somebody's not working on what you think they should. You know the breakdown of common ground. Uh, I don't want to get too much into the specialized vocabulary with it, uh, but there's this there's this continual act to build the fact that the collaborators are on the same page. Uh, and right now. Uh, we're starting to see agents that are more and more autonomous and able to do more things, but they're not able to repair the common ground with people yet. And that's something that I would like to see is to the point where we can have that more back and forth dialogue. You see some of this in the complaints about AI being a black box. Um, it's like, oh, it's very powerful and it's very helpful, but I can't, I can't reason with them or be like, hey, chill out a little bit. Right? You've got to actually go in and open the box and tinker the parameters. Uh, and so it it starts to get um, starts to get interesting that way in terms of how do we collaborate um, rather than use AI technologies. Though I, I would say that one of the advantages of not necessarily going all the way there is that you know the, the, like the reason in practice that I can't always just talk with a human collaborator is you know people's time is valuable to them and. I can I can waste GPT's time, and that's just you know costing OpenAI some money that <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> or you know if they if they really get bothered, I'll just have to pay them. But it's still like if I want to just completely discount the idea that GPT you know uh, presents to me, I'm not going to offend it. If I you know go and get someone to work with me and they give artistic or creative insight, um, then you know they get attached to the project, and I'm like, no, we're not going to do that. Then that has a real you know, that has a consequence that working with the AI doesn't have. So in the in the sense that there are certain things that I guess are, you know, this isn't the biggest safety in the sense of like people dying or things like that, but at least as far as being able to work more um, selfishly with an AI than you should work with a person uh, is maybe a, an interesting benefit, at least for at least for AI as it is. Yeah, as, as it's characterized now, it is subordinate to you whereas you would need to negotiate goals with the other person who may want to sleep. Well, I mean, it also has like, um, it has no memory. So 
there's no consequence of your interaction with it other than the the you know the energy burned. Right, uh, short term game theory versus long term a little bit. Yeah, I mean that, that's one way to put it. I guess I was also yeah, just yeah. thinking like if, if, imagine if if you had uh, the online learning version of GPT and every time you asked it a stupid question, everyone else who used it had you know the model that was now kind of biased towards your stupid question that creates externalities that are currently that you can currently avoid very cleanly. Right. Um, regarding regarding fits list, I think it's really interesting because like you know um, looking over some of the things, it's like um, you look at like accuracy and speed and things like that, and it feels kind of like only better at where like if you're gonna run like um, a large language model, it's way more intensive, way slower than most algorithms uh, that we routinely interact with. But like uh, you get some, and, and and I think a lot of it's specious, but like you get some more like inductive um, reasoning and you get maybe some more flexibility. So it almost feels like we're like almost moving along this curve of like having to trade off some of these things, which is kind of interesting to see. Like you get you get maybe some more like, and, and again, I mean, like I think that machines making decisions that humans should be making is usually a nightmare. I mean, like it's always, it, you know, a nightmare, but like, um, we're we're kind of trading some of our speed for some of these abilities that people are usually better at. So kind of interesting. Mm. To be fair, we we need to be it. We're trying to usually build tools that benefit humans. Uh, so uh, I don't know about the point about being a, a, an assessor. Although I completely agree that this is uh, certainly a, a substratist or or species or. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's some some kind of that. So it's a sort of unfair to to try, and and uh, and just assess um, the capacity, abilities, the the interestingness of uh, of of those those creatures uh, with human standards. But then again, yeah, that's that's what we <laughs> that's what we know best, um, or or the only thing we know. Uh, so it's 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 tough. So it, I think it joins what we said earlier about the oracle so some things we're going to completely miss uh, uh altogether and that's uh that's good to know <laughs> there was a question i, I would Andy. argue that um oh yeah go on uh the um the, this idea of personal assistance is coming anyway i mean i see uh, a point in the not too distant future where things like siri which are, are quite useless right now, will become um, more proactive. So instead of you asking Siri to set you an alarm, it will, uh, you know, some personal assistant on your devices will start to learn things about you privately, not, uh, not things that are shared with everyone else. I mean, the, the model that's running on, on your devices will, will start to to create its own database and, and and personalize itself towards you and then it'll you know it'll say oh by the way i noticed you have an early meeting tomorrow i'll set you an alarm for six. Oh, um while you were asleep there was this interesting stuff that happened you know on the internet uh, would you like me to summarize it you know, so it'll it'll start um doing useful things for you proactively as opposed to you having to ask it to do those things and over time it will you know, l learn more about you and um, be able to to make better suggestions and stuff. Obviously, this this kind of thing would be be driven, you know, by like financial uh, incentives, right? It would, you know, it would start probably also advertising things to you and stuff like that. But I mean, I, I see a a point in the future where everyone has their own personalized uh, assistant, right? And I I don't see why that wouldn't be the case for things outside of daily life, like research. Yeah, I'd really like to have a model that uh, if I'm writing a paper, it would say, oh, hey, did you know that this idea has been done before? Check out these references. Or, hey, you might really be interested in, in this sort of thing. It would be really cool to have a model that uh, was able to summarize research in such a way that it acts as an expert on the literature and can make all sorts of suggestions and um, point out things that are, I don't know, things that are potentially useful, um, but 
Yeah, something that acts as a uh, uh, an expert in collaborative research writing. I, I would love to see that next, <laughs> yesterday, actually. <laughs> if possible, yes. The, the yesterday would have been ideal. Um, maybe it did happen, I didn't check. But you know, That's like the I, I I'm really into. Sorry, Andy. Yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, the 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 companionship. I really like it. You know, movie uh, her really into this. Um, and I think it's, I think it's going to happen. I'm really em empathic with 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 that. I, I actually I want to be uh, to, able to 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 experience that. You know, like different types of friendships with 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 other beings. Um, all very fun. I think there is another type of such assistants or tools that, that we already have um, that are not that agential or, uh, or don't feel autonomous, but that we just wear them. Uh, I don't know. So something like glasses, right? Like, or your, maybe, maybe some, some features of your phone or, or things that you use in, in your OS uh, change, change my life forever. Things, I don't know, simple things like tools. I, I, don't, I don't have to, to, to go click for on an app where like just I can type the name of the app. It's, it's, it's a small thing. Uh, but it changes everything in what I do. Um, and th there are a lot of those tools that sort of augment uh, my capacity to do stuff. It doesn't feel like much. It's sort of augmentations that are part of me now. Uh, that, you know, like I, I always say this, but, but they're that blind, blind, blind person's cane, right? A kind, kind of tools or, or math. I have math. I, you know, it's, it's me now. Uh, <laughs> it's, some of it is not me. I have to look it up. Um, but there's so, so so there's a sort of distinction between um those creative tools that are part of me that i can sense through i can sense through math right i understand science through math but there there are tools that are are separate from me where i i have to ask questions and maybe it's about those channels that are narrower right like with Alyssa and and, and martin we talked about that a lot uh Right. So, and, and, but maybe I want also the, the other tools are very broad channels that where I can interact immediately with and I feel integrated with. Uh, so I'm sort of asking if, if, yeah, uh, what, what about, what about those, what about reach through co cognitive GPT, like something like that? Um, is, uh, isn't, isn't that a thing too? Because it already exists for, for certain domains. Uh, how about those ones, those assistants? Yeah, I mean, that kind of stuff is more interesting to me than the more agentic things, at least from my own processes. I mean, I like, I, I guess I'm a bit of a misanthrope in that I often would rather not necessarily collaborate on something when I'm really getting into something, right? Like when I'm inspired to do something, I just want to be left alone, sit and code it or investigate it or whatever. And, you know, when I have results, I want to discuss them or when I have, you know, questions or uncertainties. Um, but like, I don't necessarily want, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a manager. <laughs> that was like the, whenever I, I applied for any kind of position or anything like that was the rules. Like, yeah, I, I refuse to be promoted into management. No matter what happens, I'll quit. Um, <laughs> so like, I definitely don't want AI that makes me into a manager. Um, that at least for me, that would not be, uh, mm -hmm. that would not be good. I wouldn't use it. Um, but you know, things that, um, you know, things that do surprise me, I think would be valuable, uh, things that do give me affordances that I don't have, or that are very hard or expensive for me to acquire. I, I mean, that's the reason I like the AI art stuff, the, the image generation so much is, you know, that the I've, when I did my, my, my game in whatever 2012, I did programmer art for everything and, you know, played with Krita and a stylus, and it was all really terrible. And basically, you know, despite spending probably, uh, I don't know, a thousand hours learning various kinds of drawing and things like that over time, not just on that game, but like just in general, it, it w definitely wasn't professional and it wasn't really sellable, honestly. Like that was the thing that people are like, yeah, the art's terrible. I'm not going to pay for this. So, um, you know, the, the fact that now there's this thing that I can download that not only brings that quality up, but still allows me to exert my agency through it um that kind of combination is is amazing like that's life-changing uh mm -hmm. you know the same way that walking yeah. around with google translate is life-changing you can go to a country you don't speak the language and still get around um so that sort of thing would be the 
or that's the sort of thing that draws me to the field, I guess I should say. Um, and in general, like for, for more arcane scientific stuff, AI is kind of like a superpower because when you are doing things in the physics way of having to write down models of stuff and so on, when the world gets complicated, that approach just doesn't work. There, there's a very small number of questions you can still answer using physics techniques on real world systems. And those questions are still important. Um, and it's kind of amazing that you can answer some of them, but like, it's still very unsatisfying when someone might say, hey, could you use a, a computer model to figure out how to get people to express general antibodies to HIV so that they you know, become immune uh, versus a specific antibody to a strain that's going to be escaped? I'll be like, well, I can, I can make very general comments about like how I would construct a simulation of the gain of immunity and the development of antibodies, but I, there's no way that that simulation will ever be able to suggest a specific drug or a specific adjutant to add into a into a vaccine or anything like that. It's impossible. Like you cannot get the details right as a human. There's just too much. Um, and with the with AI methods, they're kind of a natural complement to the stuff that you learn to do in, in those sciences in the sense that they don't understand mechanism or why things happen, but they can integrate far more detail and you know, adapt to far more detail about natural systems than a human would ever be able to do in hand constructing a model. Um, so as long as you don't, as long as you don't abuse them and try to use them to understand mechanism, then it's kind of a really good partnership. And when you start to say, I want them to do what the physicist can do, it's like fits list again, where uh, not exactly fits list, but it's the physics version of it, where it's like, okay, this is you're going to be struggling with the AI. Uh, you know, or well, really, you're going to be struggling with the referees of the paper because the AI can't answer causal questions, and like the the model is only a spotlight that shows you where things are. It can't actually, you know, um, explain why the why of something. Um, but yeah, I I used to um, do some work in materials informatics and um, to kind of like relate. It, to that it's like yeah it, like exactly like you said it's like the um the models are i think for a lot of domain experts like especially useful for like generating um hypotheses from like you're not going to um necessary like like in some ways like in materials informatics like one of the main goals is finding exceptional materials that will have some properties um and if we were to run like the actual you know exact precise calculations it would take years and years and years to evaluate some of these but you can narrow it down the search space but also you can like look for patterns that you that, that the model finds in the data that you have that would be like really, really difficult to like search through as a person. Um, so I definitely think there's this sense of like, you know, a, a, like not just narrowing the search space, but being able to say like, this will not give me like an answer, but it can point me towards hypotheses that are um, most interesting or at least promising. Uh, and I, I think that's one thing that even like in the domain of like when you see them applied into things like search engines, like it's scary when people think that like um, Sydney Bing is like telling the truth all the time. Like it, like you can certainly generate like interesting things to riff on from like these models, but I, I definitely think that like delineating between, you know, being able to say, being able to like give you options and being able to like actually tell you truthful things about the world is like really important i think and um so yeah that's 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 one thing that comes to mind from that do we want to take a short break to get some tea or something come back in 10 minutes and continue yeah. or should we just keep going or i i'm, I'm seeing thumbs up for a break so let, i'm just going to call 10 minute break um come back and we can maybe segue over into how the, how to build these AIs or how to build AIs differently. Sounds great. Sounds good. So very effective break. <laughs> All right. <laughs> See you at, uh, well, in, in my time zone, 9.55. Uh, so yeah, in 10, 10 minutes. Cool. Right. Sounds good. Sounds good. So
not everyone's back yet, so. I'll, uh, maybe I'll ask ChatGPT to summarize the notes so far. Oh, dear. <laughs> it's kind of a lot. I don't know if it'll fit into the problem. No, it probably won't. Mm. I mean, I, I think, like, the, the thing, if we have a set of um, the stuff that people wanted or parts of people's creative process that uh, were mentioned, and, you know, if we look at what... Um, what that means as far as like what the AI has to do. Or, you know, we pick one of them or one at a time. I don't know, we have an hour or so. Um, probably aren't gonna do more than one or two of them and kind of look at like what an AI that would actually be, What you know, I don't know how much in technical details we wanna get, but we have a lot of people who are pretty technical on the ML side here. Um, so we could even get into like, what would a loss function look like? What would a task look like? to actually make the kinds of AI that could contribute to those parts of the creative process. I mean, some of the things that we talked about, I I have no idea, but that might make it really interesting to discuss. <laughs> like, how would you make, how would you actually architect an AI to answer the question of like, um, you know, what theorems should we be trying to prove? What mathematical quantity should we define? You know, what what uh, what should the word life mean in a quantitative and scientific manner? How do we make that AI? Uh, <laughs> that's the, that's the hard end. Um, oh, good. <laughs> the I mean, easy I, end is. I actually wanted to say something about. Oh this yeah, sorry. When you guys were talking about it earlier, but uh, the conversation sort of did move towards the hmm. the technical side of things. But I don't know how many uh, of you have tried. Um, asking GPT the same question over and over again to see the different sorts of things it spits out. And, and it, it does tend to kind of center around a, a, a few things in many cases. So um, as an example, I, yeah, I, had a, I, I gave it a prompt. Um, you just came up with a brilliant idea. Describe the idea and the science behind it in detail. Include proofs and design instructions where needed. After presenting the idea, ask and answer a series of cross-examining cross questions about it. Now, if you give that to, to GPT uh, just as the prompt, um, it comes up with a lot of ideas uh, on like eco-friendly en energy generation and, and things like that. Um, but if you, uh, if you change that prompt, so instead of I came up with a brilliant new idea, you, you say something like, uh, oh, sorry, you just came up with a brilliant new idea in the field of machine learning, then it will start uh, generating, again, I ideas, um, actually much more sort of specific ideas uh, about um, uh, ideas to improve things like uh, optimization, um, uh, things like that. And if you then, um, narrow the field further, I, you just came up with that brilliant new idea in the field of reinforcement learning, then it sort of centers around um, I, ideas about um, yeah, um, epsilon uh, greedy strategies, uh, ex uh, exploration exploitation strategies, um, and ways of like optimizing, um, uh, optimizing the um, loss function, things like that. So, uh, um, yeah, but if you have a conversation, if you if you prepend a conversation about something else, and then you just ask it to come up with a, a new idea, it tends to come up with then an idea in that field or something. So you can control the sorts of ideas it comes up with, but they do, tend to not be all that varied. But for the purposes of what we were talking about earlier, and I, I don't know what sort of uh, research we were talking about, but if you would prepend the prompt with some discussion about that area of research and then ask it to come up with that, an idea, it might actually turn out to come up with um, things that you haven't thought of. They might not necessarily be valid, but it might be that creative spark you needed if you got stuck, you know. So that's sort of what I wanted to say about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've I've tried various things. One of the things that I uh, tried earlier, on, I mean, with GPT three, even so before ChatGPT, was to basically ask it like, 
you know, I'm a researcher. What does my schedule look like tomorrow? And then say, all right, be more specific. All right, be more specific. All right, be more specific. And like it did eventually be specific. Um, but I found that in doing that, a lot of the things that comes up with, I, I've also done the same thing for things like game design. Like how would you how would you design a system to, you know, to be like this, or I have a system that's like this and details, you know, going and how would you design it to be more like this? I do find that it that especially with chat GPT, it's become more generic. Um, and so it's more likely to be things that I've seen, like if I'm in that community of, and I know what people are kind of talking about, it's much more likely to remind me of things that I've already kind of seen and past whatever judgment I'm going to pass on from other people. Um, which that's like, we, we could do a deep dive into why exactly it's become more like that. I mean, I, I think that, I think that there's a combination of this, the nature of the instruct layer and how that was how that feedback was provided and you know the sort of motivations of the people who provided that feedback but also i think that there's actually a problem with fine tuning like a fundamental almost a mathematical issue with fine tuning um agree yeah yeah definitely i mean i don't use chat gpt because a it often just says oh, i'm an ai and i can't do blah 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 <laughs> um uh, and also, well, I mean, I don't, I don't have the paid version, so it, it does that even more. I think uh, for those who who've subscribed and and, and can access GPT four through it, then you get more interesting answers. But it's still um, there's that filter that they they put on on the web interface for Chat GPT that makes it less useful than accessing, for instance, GPT four directly. Right. Um, I've been using GPT-4 through a um, Lex.Page, like page, which is like a word processor where you can write stuff and then you can just prompt it to, to continue writing. Um, and that's quite useful because then it sort of keeps the context uh, of what you were previously chatting about. So you can have a conversation with it where it, it kept all that previous, uh, previous context. And, and yeah, like you, you mentioned, like having, Starting it off with something uh, that will bring you to, to, or that will make it generate an idea that would be relevant to what you want, and then continuing that conversation is probably the way to go. Yeah, but I think like also, there, you know, the, I mean, maybe maybe this is how we started off. I, I guess I would say the, there are a couple of things about GPT which were realized leading to the kind of instruct GPT paradigm. And that took us somewhere else, but kind of seeing that trajectory, we can sort of see the, you know, the way it could have gone that it didn't go. So like when when GPT is first trained, it's just you know ma predict the next symbol, right? Predict the next token, um, and then you sample from that either greedy. Well, I would do greedy, but everyone seems to want to do beam search. Um, uh, and there are actually there are also problems with beam search, like typicality. Um, so one. You know, one of the one of the known problems with doing beam search on the output is that every symbol is sort of highly likely because the sort of the the likelihood of the whole thing is the is the sum of the log likelihoods or the log likelihood of the whole thing is the sum of the log likelihoods of the symbols. Um, so you don't want to like lose out on the optimization by allowing some symbol to be high entropy. But in human language, there's actually a distribution of entropy of symbols and the beam search will move you away from that distribution of entropy. And that has certain biases, like it favors very short responses. Um, so for email responders, that's why you get, uh, you know, oh, great, or yes, or, you know, thank you, or something like that, because those are a higher log likelihood, um, but they're not typical. And that that distinction is like a subtle one. You have to understand what you're, what you're aiming for, right? You don't necessarily just want to make the best loss function value, but you want something that captures some property of human speech that is important to what you're trying to do, that it's communicative. Um, so it has to have high entropy symbols uh, because those are the things that carry the the, the unique information, basically. Um, so you know that's the starting point. And when you do the instruct fine tuning, you kind of remove a lot of the cruft um, that, yeah, these are valid human, you know, human generated sentences in English or whatever, but they don't get to what you want. Um, but at the cost of very much narrowing down the sort of scope of the model. So if people are kind of asked to judge, like, out of these four responses, what's the best? 
well, very risky responses are going to be very unlikely to be at the top of the list. Like they, they may be much better when they are good, but they're more consistently going to be down the list. So they're going to be excluded. Um, so there are things like this, like if we wanted to actually come up with the pipeline to get a large language model that actually would give you like novel research ideas that would still be kind of like, they might be wrong, but they'd be supported. They'd be like sort of um, worth trying, right? Like that that's the thing in research. You want something that has a good likelihood to be wrong, but it's still kind of solid enough that it's worth trying. You have enough of a reason that even if it doesn't work, you've learned something when it failed. Um, so, you know, you could think about how would you, how would, what parts of that pipeline would you replace with different sorts of objectives or different sorts of pressures? You know, how maybe you would even interact with the model differently than prompting, um, because there are a lot of ways to interact with these models other than prompting if you have the weights, which we see a lot of in the image stuff because, you know, because of stability and, and you know, also a lot of a lot of people doing open source stuff in that field, whereas the language models became too big to actually do on consumer hardware very quickly. Um, and now I guess we have like Llama, or, or we're not supposed to have Llama, but we have it. Um, and you know, people are starting to try some of these experiments, but like, you know, stuff like textual inversion, where you make kind of magic tokens that do certain things to kind of get it to do what you want. Things like control net, where you're actually feeding in um, kind of parallel control signals. Like if you know the structure of what you want, but you don't know how to fill that structure, you could, you could, for instance, make a make something like GPT generate into a template that is like the kind of the the document format that you want it to fill or something like that. And maybe that would help you control the things you need to control, but let the other things be uncontrolled. Um, yeah, that that's the sort of stuff. Um, well, and so when we think about the, yeah, so like, like you said, I mean, um, you start with the pre-training and then it does kind of feel like, and you know, you, well, I mean, so I think a lot of people would argue that like even the, pre-training is kind of like mode seeking where um, you are always trying to minimize surprisal. Like you are always trying to say what is the most typical output given the data. Um, and so I feel like, you know, we start with that kind of setup and then we go further and we do, you know, instruction tuning and reinforcement learning with human feedback. And like, like you said, the, um, the reinforcement learning with human feedback feels like it's even more restrictive. Like people talk about interacting with the models and you know everyone always points out like they're very quick to say, I can't do that, which is partially, you know, again, due that due to that like uh profit motive, of course, but like it does feel like we already have this training objective that is seeking something that's a little bit average a lot of the time. And then we further you know, restrict it uh, to the point where we're like, okay, we want something average and we want something that writers who probably aren't like, you know, like in the field that we're interested in will approve of it. So you, I mean, so like one thing that comes to mind is if you wanted to find something that was like particularly interesting to a group of experts in a domain, you could say, we're gonna skip the RLHF with, you know, a bunch of kind of random people who we recruited and instead go straight to domain experts and have them do, uh, and, and you'd probably want to just tune, fine tune on, you know, the data that they're interacting with anyways, like, or if it's textual, and then just say like, we'll, we'll replace the RLHF with um, RLHF that actually uses experts. I mean, and it's hard because like getting people who are experts in a field to commit to something that, that that like takes that much time is usually not easy but like um i think that's one approach is like using the reinforcement learning in ways that are not kind of like seeking uh the most bland response would be would be one place to start i think could you fake it could you do something like let's say you got a bunch of archive papers and then you found the ones that were really highly cited and then you sort of forced GPT to pretend like it actually generated both the well-cited one and the not well-cited one and then use that to reinforce. Well, and and so like when you look at what Anthropic is doing and I, I a mm -hmm. lot of the people who have access to Claude uh, and like I don't use Slack so I don't, but like a lot of the people who have access are like, you know, this is way better in a lot of respects than GPT-4, like qualitatively. Mm -hmm. 
and so I think that you know the RL AIF, so reinforcement learning with AI feedback, that's like yeah, that's a really powerful thing because uh, you could imagine you know basically having expert models, and they even do this with um, sampling. There's this paper that was like, we'll sample with a little model that we know will be bad, um, and we'll sample with a big model that's better, and we'll like extrapolate past the big model, almost like uh, yeah. free guidance. But so you could imagine saying like, we'll have an expert model on archive, we'll have a model that's more generalist, maybe more bland, and then we'll um, critique, because these models are better at critiquing uh, than generating novel things a lot of the time. So you could imagine trying to approach this with kind of expert models that um, critique the generalists. So yeah, it's kind of interesting. But like you said, I mean, it's hard because a lot of the hardware is pretty expensive. But yeah, I mean, I wonder if even just like a really simple upgrade would be to instead of doing the RLHF directly on the weights, do a control layer like control net and basically um, have it so that the, the you know, all of the adjustments made by the RL are in some sense um, coded for with something that represents kind of the motives of the of the person. So it becomes another input modality that you can basically set to zero and ret retrieve the uncontrolled model because I mean, I've, I just started looking into this, but what I've noticed is that with stable diffusion, you have a budget in fine tuning that regardless of how much data you have for fine tuning, you will lose the basic properties and behaviors of stable diffusion within about 10,000 steps. Um, and it'll just stop being able to do things that it used to be able to do. Even if you have, you know, if you have tiny data sets or, or giant data sets, it doesn't really matter. You just kind of, uh, it's catastrophic for getting basically. Yeah, and you you actually can see this in um, and and people have actually done this with like um, some sort of multimodal applications, but they have these and and what it doesn't do is like control net. You're you know you like you said you retain the original model's weights and abilities, and you can just set that like residual connection to zero and keep everything. So like um, people have these adapters where they'll just add that residual in. But being able to um, start like control net with the uh, um, initialized like pre-trained weights, I don't know if people have done that with um, large language models, but I, I think it's definitely like a like an interesting idea. So like taking adapters and saying uh, we'll also like initialize with what whichever um, layers that we're gonna be adding into would be interesting in the domain of text and like. Yeah, because I mean, you never want to lose like the original capabilities unless they're bad with RLHF. But like, um, it, it's nice to think about ways to go lower resource without losing anything. And that's one reason that I just love the control net paper. Yeah, I mean, I think you can even do better. Well, I don't know if better, but like you can do cheaper than control net. At least in my own experiments, I never copy the the backbone network. I just add a couple, like three or four layers on the input. I inject into the second layer of the unit and the last layer of the unit, and that's usually enough. Um, and all of the rest is, you know, it's nice. It's probably a bit stronger, but you don't really, you don't really need to do it. Yeah, because and like you can kind of think about this, uh, and it probably transfers over in large part, but we have a lot less insight into like the internal representations of transformers with discrete tokens, I feel like. But like, you don't really want to modify a lot of the transformer when you're changing it. Some, like some of the time you do, but some, sometimes I feel like you don't want like the really um, early semantics to change that much. And ControlNet like totally uh, illustrates this where a lot of the time people set it to only change the middle block. Um, so like, yeah, I mean, I. I've always been into this idea of like, you know, you really ought to be, we or like, you know, for academics especially, I feel like we kind of have to take what we can get from industry and then use it for what we need it for, especially when we're compute bound. So the idea of like, just modify what you need and don't even touch the like early layers and all that kind of stuff, I, I think is really appealing, yeah. Um, so the, the, the goal, like one thing we want, like, it, it seemed to me, it was kind of only implicit, like it wasn't very explicit, but like, 
uh, one of the things we might want machines uh, to be able to do is come up with hypotheses. No, like that's kind of what you were talking about a little bit. No, uh, a new and actually new idea. But like, well, I guess like a hypothesis is something more concrete than an idea. So it's kind of like a theory, a theory that doesn't contradict what already exists, but maybe explain some stuff that we don't understand. We ask you like, okay, what's a theory? Give us a theory of consciousness that kind of would resolve humanity's predicament <laughs> in this respect. Like, would so, end okay, I mean, from my point of view, it's like um, ideas, right? So when I was playing around with it the other day, it came up with the, it came up with an idea of making like what was it liquid solar panels using um synthetic chlorophyll right and i checked that and apparently people are, are, are looking into that and then another idea it had was to create some sort of um energy source using bioluminescent uh organisms that can eat waste material that you know so you just basically you know hook it to the the end of the, your toilet or or something like that right and then so if you think about that right then you combine those two ideas and you have this this uh system that can create a uh, use a bioluminescent uh organisms to create light and then synthetic chlorophyll uh, chlorophyll to, to convert that light into energy and suddenly you have this little portable um waste eating machine that can generate you uh, energy right so those two uh, those two things are being researched together but it came up with the idea to combine them so that's sort of what i'm getting at right does that would that help with your use case yeah i think so. i mean with my i mean i think it like i mean it i think it would definitely help with research and it's definitely something i i also have to do in my research you know i like often i I know there's this one idea and then there's this other idea and there should be some connection, but it's kind of hard to come up with it. So then I also like to figure out what it is exactly. And then I would also often like to say, okay, what's the, what's the actual relation here between these two mathematical approaches or something like this or concepts. Um, and yeah, like coming up with, yeah, I think that this is, this would be. But the 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 elements that you're talking about those are from logic right so so you would have you want to show or maintain or uh, yeah or, or prove consistency and 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 properties of of a logical i don't know what order uh, theory is that not so how, how does that fit with you know a a, a token based uh, training model where you can confabulate uh, new elements as, as I don't know, you know, if it's language based, it's a, it, oh, yeah. I, I can see tricks to, to, to go around it. I, I, I actually, some people have done that, but it's not exactly what you, you, you want, you want to end up with pure math proof, I think. Yeah, I mean, it could, no, I, I mean, it's often it would be enough if it's just an idea, no, I mean, like often, often it, it's not always, uh, not always it doesn't always have to give me the proof right away it's it's fine if it says okay this is a way it could work and then i can i can read it and then i think okay maybe maybe it does and then i can i can also check myself or use some other software to check it like, like the like it is i, I mean, think then, you know cloud, cloud or gpt is going to do that for you uh, already i mean some of it it's regurgitating some some ideas from whatever obscure field of physics, but it's doing it, right? What is it? What did you say? Which I mean, it's, it's going to, to throw ideas at you that 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 might work or not as as long as you interpret them the right way. Uh, what is is it that called? is that satisfying? I, I'm wondering just just to clarify what what you meant by you know that, uh, what would make you happy. Yeah, no, I think I think it I think. I think the question is a little bit okay. How specific can it do this? I don't know. Actually, I, I, because I have not tried this uh, hard enough, I think, or long enough. Like I, 
like this idea that uh, I mean, what what Andy mentioned seemed already like that seemed like pretty good. It's a bit uh, it's a bit removed from what I need, but basically, how specific can it actually uh, go? Is kind of a like would be kind of interesting. Like, how much can I force it to actually? Uh, like if it's not just if I don't just say give me an idea about reinforcement learning, but it's like give me an idea about how the idea in this paper and the idea in this paper are connected. Can it do this? I don't know. I think uh, I think the way you would have to do that is you would have to create a, a rather long prompt that encapsulates some information about the ideas that you want it to to work on. If there's not a lot of literature in the in the field, uh, there's if there's not a lot of literature in likely in its training data about the sort of things you're working on, then you would have to you would have to provide it with some uh, just to guide it. I mean, I think I don't think in your case it sounds like you could just ask it. Uh, you know, you came up with a brilliant new idea in the field of whatever it is you're working in. You would have to give it a little bit more than that, but I think it might be possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think probably yeah, I would I would kind of expect that I would need to give it like a few papers, because there's probably like ten papers yeah. or like five yeah. even only on this stuff I'm interested in. Sometimes I mean not always, uh, but and then I I would have to give that give those. Maybe I should just try this. <laughs> Maybe it works. I think one thing that. I keep coming to in various machine learning applications and it's it feels like one of those things that has a lot of potential that's not 100% tapped but the idea of um latent and I I don't just mean like the latents that control a GAN but also the like hidden layer representations that are kind of um that act as like instrumental goals for the overall computation that the network learns to do so you know it, it's a pretty standard pattern that you have some kind of very complicated data, you train like an autoencoder or an inference engine or something on it, and you take some kind of lower dimensional intermediate representation. And then that intermediate representation has all these side beneficial properties with regards to that data. Like it's a much, you know, much better thing to do inference on to ask questions, or you can you can engineer it to be such. Um, it can be, you know, uh, if you chop off the encoder, you can use it as part of a generative driver. Um, but in some sense, it captures like underlying structure. And the I guess the thing about it that's really appealing is that it, it's almost like a mathematical idea of what structure, what, how would you mathematize the idea of structure? And that kind of structure, I think, in research is often what you're kind of looking for. You're looking for something that connects um that that lets you do something in a connective way not just something that connects it but that actually uh empowers you to do something connectively um so you know of course that's always that's like all well and good but they're they're strings of floating point numbers or whatever i mean they're, they're just high dimensional vectors um so when you take that extra step of trying to connect it to scientific process it's usually terrible um then you know the, there's it's all, all sorts of a nightmare to try to like write a paper where you said, oh yeah, I trained this autoencoder and these are the latents and dimension four means this. It's like, no, you can't, you can't do that. Um, but I wonder if there's some kind of linguistic equivalent of a latent, something like in the process of generation, if, you know, if we didn't think of it as just regurgitating a document that it was in the training set, but if we said like, there are various channels of text generation or text input and they relate to each other in such a way, would there be something like a latent layer of text that you could infer given, say, the input layer and the output layer? So imagine that instead of um, training GPT style things on just a document, you have some kind of um, stream of related text where you have like the, the imp you know, you actually separate like the input text, which is the thing that's being asked for and the output text, which is the thing that's being produced. So rather than saying these are part of the same document, you actually do say that they're separate. Um, and then you say, what would the text have to be in this hidden layer that having seen that text in the hidden layer, it would let you make the connection between the input and the output. That text would probably be interesting to a scientist if it's actually in English and not just in you know some AI language. Hmm. There is, there's this really cool 
paper that took um, CLIP. So basically the way that CLIP works, if people aren't familiar, is you have an image and you have a text and you have a um, encoders for both of those. And then you have a shared latent space where those two representations are uh, well related in that latent space. But the cool thing that these people did was they took that system that just you know tells you like like a lot of people when they're using clip will they'll they'll basically use it for the purpose of saying this is how like related this text and this image is. Um, but these people decided they wanted it to be like interpretable this latent space, so they made it sparse and they forced it to be mapped to words. Um, and it was one of the one of my favorite papers in like several years, but they, they were basically able to have this latent space that they forced to be sparse and like made up of words. And so when you encoded like um, a photo of an eagle or even like a text um, about an eagle, it would have all of these like loosely associated concepts within the latent space, but they were all um, mapped onto words. Uh, and it was just zany to see that because a lot of the time, it, yeah, it really is the case that like, we don't really, we just want the connection between two things and we want it to be interpretable, but it's like a, a lot of the time it's really hard to do when we're um, focusing on having just the highest like predictive power possible instead of having like uh, interpretability like baked in. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try to find the paper and link it because it was, it was so great. Hmm. Yeah, sounds interesting. Yeah, I'm really interested in latent space as well, um, mostly because I'm interested in uh, how biological agents sense their environment or they sense things. It doesn't necessarily need to be their environment, but maybe some part of, of their body, like, you know, my foot uh, falls asleep and I sense that, right? Um, and I'm, I really enjoy thinking about the process of how my brain is interpreting those signals in some sort of internal biologically encoded latent space. So I'm wondering if there can't be a way to do a meta study on multiple different um, models that look at a particular mode of data such as text. And I don't know, can we, is there something to generalize there about how mathematically these things get um, encoded in two different layers. Does it does it also differ wildly uh, according to the what the models are used for? So if you have a model that is used to simply uh, generate output like GPT versus a model that is using that text to generate an image, how do those two latent spaces differ when you feed uh, the same text into it? I don't know. It, it seems like there's. It, it would be really cool to see a paper or some sort of research on that if it hasn't been done already. I'd really like to see it. It'd be fun. And what does it say about information more broadly? Not to mention another paper that I'm gonna like, gonna like have to look up and try to share. But there was this paper that um, showed that the representations for language models and the representations for um, image models could be like adapted with like just so like you have like a t5 for example where it's a language model and you're um encoding text and then decoding text and doing tasks um and if i recall correctly they were able to use like linear adaptation to take like concepts from the latent space of this or the encoding space of this image model and convert it into the um representations for the image model so that which was just really surprising and like kind of fascinating because like a lot of the time we think of um, them as being like hard to adapt between like the representations of images and uh, words but sometimes they map like really effectively um, because I think a lot of the time these models are just kind of taking fuzzy concepts and making them like and, and you know kind of putting them into this space where they are like linearly separated so that they can easily be like active on so i'm um, just kind of kind of interesting how like 
we would expect a lot of these things to be disparate, but uh, they're sometimes not as uh, hard to connect between as uh, we think. Uh, another thing that was mentioned earlier that I think is really important for this. Uh, so this is this is uh, kind of like a different subtopic here, but um, we had mentioned the difference between using AI as a tool and using AI as a collaborator, or not using, but working with AI, uh, where AI has its own agency and we work in parallel with it as if we were to work with a collaborator. And I think that should be at the forefront of our thoughts and we're in when we're thinking about what these future technologies are going to look like and how we integrate this sort of technology into our creative processes. Because so I hadn't think it, thought about that explicitly. And then I thought, oh, wow, in some cases, I really do want an agent to work with. And then in other cases, I do want a tool to use that doesn't necessarily have agency, but can inform my uh, my own agency to make different decisions. Um, I just wanted to highlight that. I think that's a, uh, a important part. But I'm also wondering, um, because it's we think of it, at least I'm thinking of it right now as one or the other, where you have a really strong sense of agency and then you have a really uh, strong sense of tools. But can you have something that's in between or is that too difficult? Um, is it not useful to have something in between? What does it look like if it's something that's more in between? Is it problematic? Uh, I don't really know. <laughs> Just more things that I'm throwing out there that I thought were that were um, uh, important from that we talked about earlier. Like a post AI device, like a post AI device to intermediate between human and AI. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe. As you mean as like something in between? Hmm. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. It's strange to think about a a, a uh, gradient of agency, I suppose. Uh, I mean, you could you could do it probably by like having some kind of limited, and you could check like how many things can this agent do. You no, know? like you can say maybe it's kind of autonomous, but the things it can actually do are kind of limited. Um, so then. And then you less the less you the the less you limit this the more uh, agent the more it becomes like a full um, mm -hmm. like the less it's this kind of tool. Well, where do you yeah, want? And, sorry. Like, go ahead. Well, like I think it would helpful to think like if you. If it's a tool, you're exerting your own agency through it. If you're treating it as an agent, then its agency may disagree with your agency, or you may not be exerting agency uh, for whatever reason, like you don't have the the mental capacity, for instance, to actually uh, take as many actions it ha as it has to take or something like that, or you actually want to be disengaged from something like the self-driving car kind of situation. Um, so like, maybe if we can identify what what are the cases in which you wish your agency and its agency to be in disagreement, it'll make it clear how to have that spectrum. Yeah, I mean, Alyssa earlier talked about um, something where if she's, if she's doing some research that it would recognize that, you know, something that that piece of research has been done before or something similar has been done before because it's, it understands all of the information in in all of the papers that have, have come out um but i guess the 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 worry that a lot of people have about these um uh about these assistants is they become like clippy the paperclip right so <laughs> they pop up and oh it looks like you're writing a letter you know uh, things that you really don't want happening so so i think that's where people are going to be cautious that they don't want to create these systems that immediately get ridiculed because they look like Clippy the paperclip. I, I feel well, like when I'm writing in like uh, words, sometimes it kind of has come back or like it was like, I, and, and this happens in Google Docs too. I'll like write a sentence or maybe not Google Docs, but some word processing and it'll be like, oh, actually you should 
this is like not exactly grammatical or like this is too uh, verbose or not verbose enough and it'll correct it with like a little purple under underline instead of the red one when it's like incorrect spelling. And so like, I think that, you know, making sure the models are like, you know, if they are opinionated being like cautious about not making them annoying, it's like something that really is such a, you know, like Andy says, like big consideration on people's minds or it should be because like it's obnoxious sometimes when you get the kind of cliffy effect. <laughs> Right. Well, and, and if you think about some some bit of those examples, it's about Clippy not really understanding what it is you're up to, or that you don't want to be interrupted, perhaps. Uh, right. It's a it's a not being on the same page sort of thing. It's just like, well, time to spit out some stuff and get your attention. Um, but when when we think about uh, those degrees of collaboration versus versus tooling, I mean, you see that with with human collaborators as well, and that's. Part of why I want to be clear, like when we, if we want to use the word agency for this, it's agency within the context of the shared work that you're doing, not whether or not they have agency outside of it, right? I don't want to dehumanize the people that I'm about to talk about, but you may have a co-author that's a full co-author, or you might have a co-author that's a junior co-author that you have do certain tasks, but certain things are, maybe they can opine on them, but they don't get a final say, or uh, there's gradients all the way through to. Um, Go get some references for me, but this is this is my decision to make, right? Maybe that's not a research paper. Maybe it's some other context. Um, all the way to a much more strict uh, division of labor, uh, personal secretary, where I just need you to to check this for uh, for X, Y, and Z, um, or I need you to go find three things that do this and that, that I can stick in the bottom of of whatever. Right? There's there's degrees already in the ways we collaborate with people, whether or not they're fully agents or not. It's about the the relation the uh, the work the, the basic compact between you and the thing you're working with, and if that's you do everything I say and you don't suggest things, or it's you may even have your own separate goals, and then everything in between, um, we can still learn a lot from existing relationships that are have with other humans or even with animals, um, as models for what we might want to think about as we do this with tools that are maybe not so bossy or maybe do need to be managed i mean I, I like i want to come back to the question you know what you know in human collaboration forget about the ai again um because i agree with that that that's a good place what and then specifically in creative process or creative collaboration when do you want a dis maybe a disagreement like when do you actually want to disagree with your collaborator because I, I think you don't always want that, right? Like it's actually, it does feel good when you're on the same page. And of course being surprised, like having something that your collaborator can come up with that you didn't or that they know that you didn't is, is also kind of a nice feeling and, and also very useful. Um, but that's also something that might be possible, like not with the human collaboration, but in artificial agent con collaboration to do without actually giving the agent agency um, in the sense that like you could still you, you could optimize your relationship with it to make it an extension of your body in a way that you can't do with a human collaborator, um, at least in principle. So, you know, putting those aside, I think there might still be cases where you do actually want to uh, have a disagreement or where you want there to be, you know, agency being exerted that you are not choosing to be exerted um, in a human collaboration. And I think if we can pin down some of those example cases, that makes it clear how to make an AI that would do it. This is very similar to parallel brain that you mentioned before, that it can be in full agreement, you know, same, but stronger, or it can be very different way. That collaboration, it can be, you know, uh, collaboration with agreement or collaboration with, you know, in different, with very different ideas about the things. Like the collaborators that they think very different thing, very about, about something. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, like, I would, my, I would want my collaborator to definitely say <laughs> when I'm wrong, <laughs> when I'm actually wrong. <laughs> um, but, or like, I mean, maybe more generally, because like, of course, it's not necessarily like many, many projects. I mean, it's not always maybe or many times there is not 
no clear right or wrong. Uh, and then, I, yeah, then it becomes much more difficult, I think, if uh, when you really want to say when you want some pushback from your collaborator. Yeah, I'd also want it to consider different information because there's only so much information that can fit in my brain. So I'll work on looking at this information and I'll work on reading these ideas. And then my collaborator will work on reading those ideas over there at the same time. And if it's an AI model, maybe it does it in five minutes. And if it's me, it might take three weeks. <laughs> but at the end, I want it to say, OK, there's not right. Maybe there's no right or wrong answer here, but based on the information I got, this is what I have based on the information that you got. This is what you have. And there could absolutely be disagreements. I think if there's disagreements there, I think that's super important to see because um, that exists in literature all the time. That's sort of the, um, the Star Trek computer uh, idea, right? So instead of you spending three weeks on, on, on reading something and, and the AI doing it in five minutes, you, you ask it, okay, read everything uh, on this subject. Okay, now read everything on this subject. Now, now answer these questions that I, that I pose to you. Or, okay, ingest this data and, and show me this visualization. Or tell me um, how many things about uh, this subject were retweeted in the last 12 hours. Or, you know, uh, things where you would right now have to, have to do a bit of work read, write a bit of code, something like that, that you could just sort of converse with the with a computer and it would uh, do it all for you very quickly. I'm going to uh, raise an example that is relevant to the various hobbies I mentioned, which is that if I'm running a tabletop game, I definitely don't want the players to be an extension of my agency. That would make the entire exercise pointless. So. In that case, there's actually something where it's not just a matter of, you know, there being some different point of view or different information, um, but there's even some intrinsic value in the fact that the decisions that are being made are not being made by me. Hmm. Yeah, like, I think there are instances where um, it's sort of fun when the system is not even just like surprising, but almost like adversarial. Um, and like, yeah, and like you can see I, AI Dungeon, which I guess is kind of um, extinct now, but um, systems where you want it to be something you kind of have to work against. And I think that, um, and I think that, yeah, so I mean, it, it kind of depends on your goals in a specific like activity, uh, whether you want it to uh, have the degrees of freedom to like even, you know, go against you and contradict you in very like upfront ways. Um, but like, so one thing um, that I think Alyssa brought up was this idea of like other like sources of information and I, I think I see people do this sometimes where they'll like um, have the model kind of role play someone with like a different point of view and I and I think someone also brought this up earlier but like you see people saying like okay emulate someone from this other field and like tell me what you think they'd say about this you know uh, paper or opinion or idea and it's like I, th I think that that's one powerful thing being able to like workshop um, ideas and have the model kind of take on a persona that you might not have access to um, as easily otherwise. I mean, there may also be some cases where not knowing the goal of the other or being forced to operate when you don't know the goal of the other could actually uh, help with creativity. Like um, this is getting a little bit outside of the like, you know, image generation and so on kinds of fields, but if I am doing something like playing Go, um, the fact that the other player might choose all sorts of different moves is something I have to keep in mind. And then when I'm coming up with what move to make, you know, even the moves that they don't necessarily choose in the end, I have to be aware of them because they could choose them. 
or like um, this comes up in more theoretical stuff with uh, with reinforcement learning cooperation agents. Um, if they're trained together, they have this kind of unfair advantage that they that they know each other too well. They're like the same agent, really, just with split brain almost. Um, so if you have a game like uh, like Hanabi or something, which is this kind of um, well, I don't, I can't explain Hanabi. So there's like a toy version that Lewis Kirsch I think uh, made that is the same kind of uh, structure where you have like you have these ten number or ten options, and um, two agents are picking an option. And if you pick the same option, you get the reward. And if you pick different ones, you don't. And the options have a listed reward. Nine of them all give you a reward of one, but the tenth has a reward of like 0.8. And if you are playing, uh, if you train two AIs on that, they'll pick one of the, they'll arbitrarily say like, I, let's always just pick option five that has the score of one. Um, and, but that's very artificial because if you were playing that game with another human, um, you'd have to pick the point eight because that's the only thing that is different. And that's the only way you could know that, that, that they're also going to agree with you on what's different. Um, so there are situations like that where, where the inability to control your partner or to to have that kind of understand enough understanding of your partner that you can kind of turn them into an extension of your will uh, is important to explore at least certain parts of a possible space. Um, I don't know if it's so relevant in research creativity, but like in a lot of other things, you could definitely see it ha having an artistic impact. Yeah, I think there's this difference between interacting with a large model directly and interacting with its instantiation over a, a very specific either persona or or simulation whatever it is right and sometimes you really want that personal uh, per, and as personal as the right word but yeah i guess personal in, in instance to 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 me kind of relation and sometimes you just want to query the, the whole space um if you query this the whole space it doesn't have one personality it doesn't it doesn't have it doesn't have any uh, it is just it has summary statistics and 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 all of the things that maybe you're seeking uh but instead maybe you want for the tabletop thing for the music thing for in general a uh, creative arts thing uh, i think you want the personal link right the subject to subject i, I think th this theory of mine won't work at all so if if, if you're seeking to to uh to study any of that that won't work with the with the large model so and and, and when you intense instantiate it there are so many ways to do it um because again it's 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 uh it's you building your oracle as you speak right so also you need to know what kind of what kind of instance you want uh to 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 be able to tell if if, if that's something you want in the first place also um In, I can, I, yeah, there, there are examples in which I guess uh, you, you could you could pick those at random, and because you're just looking for any any set of property that that would match, like uh, any form of of uh, interesting uh, life for, for a life, or I don't know, uh, so some kind of property you 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 already have in mind. You you have the pattern matching, and then then you, you could generate any persona that 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 brings you there. Um, But otherwise, it seems difficult. We are getting close to the three-hour mark. Um, do we have any sort of a last thoughts, summary things, things we'd like to do, calls to the, you know, calls to the world, please do this, you know, <laughs> anything like that? Hmm. Hmm. Your chance to address cross labs, one hundred or however many Oneris could probably tell us followers. <laughs> Six hundred and eighty-eight. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, that's actually a that's actually a number. All right. I mean, how I I like, like we kind of changed course at some point to yeah. this, but the, like. How like I, I'm I'm because I'm not familiar with the literature. It's like how how well 
like is there still room for improvement in understanding latents or like making latents more interpretable or making like maybe enforcing interpretable latent variables like i think that's kind of what you proposed nicholas with the making some of the latent space or, or also uh, ryan uh, you kind of say the latent space has to be actually uh language directly or something <laughs> Well, like the thing that I was proposing is that you, for example, I mean, you could even do it with GPT almost. Uh, you would need a bit more access than OpenAI gives you. But let's say you had a paragraph that was the input and a paragraph that was sort of the output. And then there was a paragraph in between that was unspecified. You could do a beam search over, uh, you know, weighted by GPT to find the text that makes the connection between the input paragraph and the output paragraph most likely. Right, and that would be a kind of latent. That would be like text that, if you saw that text, it would make drawing the conclusion that was drawn in the output from the input more likely to happen. So it would be that kind of instrumental or, or hidden variable, but it would entirely be in the form of sentences in English. Or, well, not necessarily in English, but in sentences that would cause that language model to do that, which is likely to be at least grounded in language. Right, it might be, it might have some adversarial you know, weird high frequency uh, hallucination kind of invoking structure to it, which you would have to be on the lookout for. Um, so you might have to regularize it or something, but that would be an example experiment that could be done uh, if you had access enough to the model that you could generate the intermediates. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, like I like that idea of like almost in painting with the, and, and I think there's like, I feel like there's some work that kind of does this, but kind of like in painting from like one idea to another. I, I, I think that's interesting. And um, like you could imagine, sorry, it's like raining really hard outside if you can hear that. But um, like, yeah, I, I like that idea of we have two things that we want to know the connection to and then like drawing the bridge sort of between them with like natural language. I, I think that's an interesting one, yeah. But even in latent space, we need to know the background information, the latent variables. For example, if in the case of image recognition system, or let's say face recognition system, we should know that latent variables they are representing faces, and they are a kind of you know uh, abstract features of related faces somehow. So also the environment, the space is so informative abstract but that background information without that background information maybe is meaningless you know yeah i think yeah i like this um and i wonder how 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 easy it would be to to have a sort of uh uh, remember how we, we talked a lot, I think last year or, or two years ago uh, at this workshop about uh, different models of chemistries that, that would, would make it interesting, I think. So so, uh, so Lisa, Nicholas, like uh, various people here are interested in that. Uh, I wonder how, how this chemistry would work for, for semantic spaces, uh, how we can, can combine um, I guess sentences, words uh, in, into meanings and that, that, that goes with what Brian is, is interested in. I think this this sort of how to find bridges between two spaces, um, I would say it's how how to craft ideas. And maybe if, if you have, you can ask questions in different ways, right? So so you say, I have this bag of chemicals. They're not chemicals now, that they're, 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 they're meanings, uh, sort of, ex well, instances of meanings, I guess. Uh, and I have this other bag. What, what can what can you do with this? Uh, so so, I, or or you can ask the inverse question. I guess they, so, so I want to reach this kind of space, um, and yeah. So I I, I wonder, uh, yeah, I wonder how, yeah, if people have explored that first, um, and and how we could how we could implement that. So I have yeah, I have some ideas, but yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe we can also look into the the, the papers that were were mentioned earlier. I mean, if you just wanted like a silly g game kind of thing, what you could easily do is just use GPT or any of these models as an energy function, 
and then you have your pool of resources that are conserved. So you say, you know, these are the sentences that I'm allowed to use, or these are the words that I'm allowed to use. And I can't just generate whatever token I want. I, but I will pick um, the token that has the highest likelihood, um, you know, to form complexes of three words or complexes of five words. And then I have to kind of like, uh, then you'd have to Monte Carlo kind of jiggle it because, you know, it might greedily take one token that would be better somewhere else just because that's what got tried first. Um, but you could have, you know, your whole chemistry simulation of basically, you know, associating these words into sentences, which are the molecules and the sentences with each other and, you know, bond breaking, bond splitting, et cetera. Um, I think the conservation law is the thing that's important to make it actually do anything, especially if it's like spatially, um, you know, if these words are actually spatially distributed and they, they can like diffuse, but when they get bound into bigger sentences, they don't diffuse as much because then you'd have like, you, you'd map space into different kinds of um, styles of writing or things that are likely to not be in the same document as each other as like, you know, stuff would steal, would deplete the area of the words that would really fit with it. Um, and then we kind of pin in place and everything else would have to kind of make something that works. You know, it's like uh, if we were doing it at the level of letters, the very first thing eats all the E's. And then you have a lot of uh, a lot of sentences that are trying to figure out how to be really likely, but not use any any of the letter E anywhere. But I don't know if it would really like tell us anything about anything, you know, <laughs> it wouldn't propose theorems for Martin, for example, but it might be a neat little like a life. Uh, <laughs> toy it would be it would be an art piece right that would be the real use of it yeah for now no just uh, that, that would be the use I of it <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah i guess i would want to kind of limit the the kinds of concepts that are allowed but i guess that's a bit harder than just not allowing some letters are we getting kicked out all right no i accidentally opened something Oh. Um, well, anyway, we're we're yeah, getting exactly. to three hours, yeah, so let's. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we should probably probably stop the actual like YouTube element, and if people want to keep hanging around, I guess that's there's no problem with that. But um, that's cool. And anyone whose organization is going to force them to submit no documentation that they attended. Oh wait, it's all remote. Never mind. <laughs> well, uh, so what I'll do is um, I'll. So we took notes here. Uh, sorry, YouTube, uh, you won't be able to see those notes. Um, but I will summarize those. And um, you know, the goal is we want to come up with a, a list for people to see. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, and. So yeah, I think that wraps up today's session. It was a really, really good discussion. Thanks everybody for participating. Thank you too. Yay, really good. Um, and so we won't have another session tomorrow uh, or on Wednesday, but we will have a session. We'll have two sessions on Thursday, Japan time. So be on the lookout for those. We're really excited um, and we'll see you all later. Bye YouTube. Mm -hmm.